My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of Some Enchanted Car Hop. It was just an ordinary drive-in hamburger joint on Vermont off Sunset, but they called it Hamburger Heaven. And just to carry out the idea, they'd hired six angels to wait on cars. Three blondes, a redhead, and two brunettes. I was lucky. I drew the redhead. Only she didn't serve up what I ordered. All she brought me was trouble. The whole thing started when there were only eight more shopping days until Christmas. I fought my way through the necktie and socks set, and by the time I reached the office, I was ready to start celebrating New Year's. But my boss, the lion, had other ideas. When I walked in, all 280 pounds of him was up on an office stool. He was tacking a dried-up sprig of mistletoe over the door. Jeffrey! Jeffrey, my boy, come in, come in. The festive season is at hand. How's that again? I said the festive season is at hand. I'm filled overflowing with the Yuletide spirit. Yeah? Well, you better take those nails out of your teeth before you spring a leak. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess you're right, my boy. I got carried away. Yeah, sure. You and Tiny Tim. We're, uh, expecting women clients? Yeah, women clients? Oh, oh, you mean the mistletoe. Well, Jeffrey, you never can tell when a sweet young thing might accidentally happen in. Stop drooling, fatso. You dropped out of a mistletoe set 50 pounds ago. Well, maybe so. But I still believe in Santa Claus. Now, where was I? You were up on the stool with berries in your hair. No, no, I mean about the new client. What have I told you so far? That the festive season is at hand. Huh? Oh, oh, then I haven't told you about our new client. His name is Ward Hamilton, Jeffrey. He was in just a few minutes ago. Fine figure of a man. Well-dressed, distinguished, and prosperous. That explains the Christmas spirit. How much? Jeffrey, the Christmas spirit cannot be measured in terms of money. This is the time of goodwill toward men of unselfish devotion. Sure. How much unselfish devotion did he buy? Fifty dollars worth. It's something about his niece uh, or daughter or some friend or something. What about them? Well, it seems this girl's been receiving packages, uh, flowers, candy, that sort of thing. Well, what's so mysterious about that? Doesn't she know it's Christmas? Well, for some reason or other, Ward Hamilton says she's worried about them. Uh, he'll tell you all about it when you see him. The address is on the desk. It's out on Iredell Road in North Hollywood. So I find the Santa Claus that's been sending the packages. Say... That's right. This case does fit right in with the season, doesn't it? Sure. And Merry Christmas to you, too, fatso. That started it. I hopped in my sleigh and headed my reindeer out over Coenga Pass. Ira Del Road was twin rows of California bungalows with Christmas decorations strung out in front. All except one house. It was the address Lion had given me. Redwood front on the usual cream-colored stucco. White ranch-type fence, swimming pool in the backyard. No Christmas anywhere. Behind the fence, a big Dalmatian wagged his tail and grinned at me in a nice, friendly sort of way. Only he was growling when he did it. I circled wide and made the porch, but I didn't get as far as the doorbell. What do you want? Well, Mr. Hamilton? I'm Regan, International. Regan? Oh, yes, the detective. Come in, Mr. Regan, come in. He was big and gray-haired, the man of distinction. But what he had in his hand wasn't a glass. It was a whip, black, ten feet long, with lead weights at the tip. In here. I appreciate your coming right out, Mr. Regan. I like to get prompt action. Is that what you use that for? Well, oh, the whip. No, no. No, just a hobby of mine. I practice hitting toy ducks floating at the swimming pool. Oh, nice way to get use out of your pool during the winter season. Mm, well, yes, Never mind that. Uh, sit down, Mr. Regan. I want to tell you about Mary. That's the niece. Niece? No. No relation. I'm a close friend of her family's. Her parents died several years ago. There was no one else, so I've tried to take over the reins and help the girl along. It hasn't been easy. She isn't broken to harness. Mm, it's a nice metaphor, but it doesn't fit. Not at all. 
Mary Winter is a strange girl. Very strange. She's the shy, retiring type. Ah, I see. The detective training. You're thinking ahead, assuming that she's not attractive to men. Nothing could be further from the truth. She's a lovely girl. Very lovely. Auburn hair, green eyes, fine, firm, youthful figure. Desirable is the word, Mr. Regan. Desirable. Uh, you understand what I mean. You make it pretty clear. So, um, that brings us to the anonymous packages. For almost six weeks, someone has been sending Mary gifts almost every day. Flowers, candy, novelties, that sort of thing. No name, no indication where they come from. Mary has no idea either? No. But she's reacted to them, to them badly. They're making her nervous, upset. There's something I can't afford to have happen. Come again? Uh, Mr. Regan, I can observe that there's little use in trying to keep anything back from you. My interest in the package matter is because of money. Now the story begins to make sense. Mary is strange. Perhaps I should have said peculiar. Her aversion to men is almost... Well, I've been sending her to a Mr. Farthing, a human relations counselor. A psychologist? Uh, something like that. And it costs money? Yes, it costs money. The more delay in cure, the more it costs. Frankly, Mr. Regan, I'm tired of the obligation. She work? Yes. Uh, she works at one of those drive-in stands, car hop. Something wrong with that? The place is called Hamburger Heaven, Mr. Regan. And you want me to find the guy who sends the packages so he'll marry her, or so you can get rid of him? It works the same either way. <laughs> uh, you'll take the job, Mr. Regan? Sure. I'll find your guy. Maybe he'll look good under your Christmas tree. Ward Hamilton gave me the girl's address in Hollywood. It was a tired stucco four flat just off Kingsley, the home of Mary Winter, the girl who hated men. And then it was too easy. Standing out front near the curb was a little man in a trench coat. He carried an umbrella over his arm, and he paced up and down watching the apartment. That was too good a bet to pass up. You going somewhere? I, I beg your pardon? Someone you know lives in there? Why? Why, that's none of your business, sir. The name of the friend wouldn't be Mary Winter. Get out of my that's way. That's what I thought. Hold it. Wait, let go of my arm. Let go, I say. Why are you watching Mary Winter's apartment? I warned you. Let go. Let Answer go. Answer me. Very well. I'll answer you. The umbrella in his hand came down on my wrist, and he broke for the corner. By the time I turned, he was out of sight. On the ground, broken, was the little man's umbrella. I picked it up. Real break. Name engraved on the handle. In nice big gold letters, it said, Smith. I headed for Mary Winter's apartment. I knocked, and nothing happened. Knocked again. The radio in the room told me somebody was in and liked their music loud. I tried the door. It worked. I stuck my head in to look around. A redhead came in from another room in slacks and halter. She saw me. She dived for the closet and came out wearing a coat. Then she snapped off the radio. Get out of here! Look, I tried knocking, but... I... Get out before I call the police! The name's Regan. Ward Hamilton sent me. You... You're lying. You're trying to trick me. Phone him. He'll tell you. What, what... What do you want? About the presents you've been getting. Tell me. I... I... Oh, I'm not sure. I can't trust you. Well, look, for the last time, I'm supposed to find out who's sending them. Either you help or you don't. Now, take your choice. All right. I'll listen. But don't you come a step closer. <laughs> I sat down, one corner of the room, redhead, other corner. She was tall, graceful, beautiful, everything a guy could want. Except for the look in her eyes, scared, hunted. I waited for her to start it. They began several weeks ago, the presents. I I don't know who is sending them or why, but I... Any I, card? Identification? No, nothing. You sure? You think I'd accept gifts from a stranger? Take it easy, nobody said that. What did Farthing tell you? Farthing? This human relations counselor you go to. Oh, you know about that? Yeah, I know about that. What did he say? That that I shouldn't worry. That I, I should find out. Is that all? Oh, you don't understand. You're like all of them. Get out of Wait, here. Wait, one question. 
You know a little guy about 30 carries an umbrella, wears a trench coat, shy? No, no. Are you sure? Think. A little guy. No. No, I don't know him. I've never met him in my life. Get out! I left the redhead sobbing softly to herself. Maybe a lot of flowers and candy would be kind of nice to a lot of people during Christmas, but not to Mary Winter. She was mixed up, inside and out. I headed back to my car, and then I was mixed up. It had looked easy until I got to my car. That's when I got complications. A big complication. Fat 40 with a gun. Get in, Shamus. Now what? Your choice, Shamus. Like what? The winter dame, uh-uh. Your property? Not my type. Belong to the boss? Question, Shamus, uh-uh. Beat it, will you? I'm not through with you. Okay, get through. Stay away from Mary Winter or you get trouble. Real bad trouble. Any questions now, Shamus? Yeah. Who pays you? You shouldn't have asked that question. It looked like it was going to be a real holiday season. Brotherly love all over the place. The next stop was a man named Mr. Farthing. Only the sign on the door said John J. Farthing, human relations counselor. It was a plush layout. Waiting room the size of a box top. Rich, solid. Lined with deep green leather chairs, brass studs. On the wall, Van Gogh, Gauguin, that kind of stuff. The receptionist was out, and I took a crack at the thick mahogany door. Yes, come in, please. What may I do for you, sir? The name's Regan, international detective. Oh, sit down, Mr. Regan. Now, is something troubling you? Girl named Winter, Mary Winter. Go on, Mr. Regan. She's a patient of yours? Why do you ask? A couple of questions about him. I see. Since you know her background, I thought you could fill me in on a few things. I said... Since... I heard you, Mr. Regan. Well? Perhaps, sir, you're aware of the nature of my work. Since I assume you're an intelligent man, I don't believe it's necessary to be much more explicit than that. Try it for size. Very well. Cigarette, Mr. Regan? Thanks. There is in existence a code of ethics. Some practitioners call it the Hippocratic Oath. I'm not a doctor, as you know, yet I too, Mr. Regan, have a moral code. I'm listening. Nothing in my code, either morally, ethically, or in any other way, allows me to discuss the affairs of my patients. Is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. I'm sorry I can't assist you in whatever it is you're trying to do, Mr. Regan. I'd like to help, but as you see, my hands are tied. That makes two of us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mr. Farthing, gray suit, ivory cigarette holder, and gold cufflinks stood up and shook hands solemnly. I left. He'd given me nothing. There was only one thing wrong with that. Mr. Farthing was right. I decided to check in with my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. The International Detective Agency, Anthony... Save it for the customers, Fatso. Jeffrey, where have you been? Look, I just started this business two hours ago. What's eating you? Just this. I have here in my office with me a young man. He has an interesting story, Jeffrey. It seems he's been sending gifts to one Mary Winter. What? That's correct, Regan, the man you're supposed to be looking for. Well, don't just stand there. Get over here at once. This young man can't wait all day for lazy detectives. And besides, he needs help. He needs help? Yeah, that's right, Jeffrey. The man you were supposed to find. His life's in danger. <laughs> This is CBS, and you're listening to Jeff Regan, investigator, and tonight's adventure, Some Enchanted Car Hop. It started when a guy named Ward Hamilton hired the lion and me to find out who was sending packages to a car hop named Mary Winter. 
I met a little guy with an umbrella and a big guy with a gun. And a human relations counselor who called himself Mr. Farthing. Then I phoned my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, and found the mysterious Santa Claus who'd been sending the girl gifts had walked right into our office. When I got there, I found the lion sitting with his fingertips touching as he talked to the man across the desk from him. Like I guessed, it was the same guy I'd seen outside Mary Winter's apartment. The little guy. Thirty, trench coat, and nervous. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I want you to meet our new client, Mr. Smith. Mr. Ernest Smith, he's in trouble. Uh, well, if he isn't, he should be. Jeffrey, what on earth do you mean? I found your Mr. Smith outside the girl's apartment. He wasn't looking for frost on those windows. Oh, oh no, 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 Mr. Regan, that, that, that's... Uh, yeah, what Mr. Smith is trying to say, Jeffrey, is that that's not true. Mr. Smith is in real trouble. You sell it to him? Jeffrey, how can you say such a thing? Mr. Smith feels his life is in danger, hence he has retained us to act in his behalf. That's true, Mr. Regan. I'll admit I sent the gifts to Miss Winter. I didn't realize, I didn't Get know... Get to the point. Now, now I'm afraid... Since I saw you this afternoon, someone's following me. Fat guy, big coat. Yes. I came here for help. Someone doesn't like my sending the gifts. Well, that's real bright. Well, you can start with Mary Winter. She doesn't like them, Mr. Regan? Then there's a guy named Hamilton. She, She's married? We call him a guardian, family friend. Oh. Uh, Finish your story. I, I like Miss Winter. I... I wanted to do something for her. So you've been sending her anonymous presents for almost six weeks. Isn't that carrying the Christmas spirit too far? Well, uh, well, I, I like her. That's not abnormal, is it, Mr. Regan? Yeah, of course not, Mr. Smith. You keep out of this, Fatso. Yeah, but, Jeffrey, I'll climb. We got another client named yeah. Hamilton, remember? Besides, you haven't met the girl. Neither have I. What? I've never met Mary Winter. Is that... Abnormal, Mr. Regan? Oh, dear. Dear, perhaps I'm sicker than Mr. Farthing told me. Say that again? Mr. Farthing, my human relations counselor, he takes care of me. Now, wait a minute. Maybe this is going to add up. You've never met Mary Winter? No. No, but you've seen her. You've seen her in the waiting room of Farthing's office. Why, Mr. Regan, how on earth did you guess? That's exactly it. She was reading a copy of Reader's Digest, and I was reading an old National Geographic. It was a fall Never mind. Day. Well, Lan, I think that wraps that up. Jeffrey, what do you mean? Mary Winter is afraid of unknown guy sending packages. Unknown guy turns out to be Smith. Take Smith to Mary, show her he's harmless. Collect our feet. Yeah, yeah, but, Jeffrey, what about Mr. Smith? What about the man who's following him? Maybe he just imagined it. Come on, Smith. We're going to visit a redhead. <laughs> The lion didn't believe Smith imagined it any more than I did. But he only sputtered, and I loaded Smith into the car and headed out to Mary Winter's apartment. It looked simple. Then, like a glass of mild eggnog. What I didn't know was that somebody had slipped me a zombie. It was turning dark when we pulled up in front of the place. Smith stayed at my heels like a sheepdog. I knocked. This time, she opened the door. Oh, Mr. Regan. What are you doing here? Brought your Christmas present. Only this one's harmless. Oh, no. Take it easy, sweetheart. Just a guy named Smith. You might even like him. No, no, please go away. Please go away. (laughs) Smith and I walked on in and Mary backed into a chair in the far corner of the room. She and Smith looked at each other and didn't say anything, so I waited for the sparks to die out of her eyes. But they didn't. There was something else on her mind. This... This is the man who sent the packages. You guessed it. Smith, Mary Winter. Mary Winter, Smith. Get him out of here! Huh? I said get him out of here before before he kills me! Oh, no! Sit down. Now, just a minute, lady. He won't hurt anybody. Just take it easy, will you? Just take quiet. That's what you're Oh, no, no. I'm Now, listen, sweetheart. Wait a minute. It's Christmas. You've heard of that, I think, haven't you? People send presents to each other because it makes them feel good. Now, Smith sent you presents for the same reason. He's going to kill me. You're like he is. Trying to trap me. Oh, that does it. All right. Look at this. What, a card? It came in a box of flowers. It was delivered here to my apartment tonight. Each man kills the thing he loves. Well, Regan, try and explain that. Try and... Shut up. Did you send this, Smith? No, no, Mr. Regan. I didn't send it. I sent flowers and candy and nice things. Mr. Regan, at the window! I left them with their mouths open and ran for the hall and then outside... 
The girl may have had an overworked imagination, but her mind didn't knock over that garbage can. It was dark and peaceful and still outside. Me and a half moon and nobody else. And then I saw him, thick set, crouched, moving away from the window. I dove after him. We went down together as his hand came out of his pocket. The heavy gray 45 got itself in my direction, and I grabbed at the wrist behind him. The gun fell into the rose bush, but he got to his feet. I warned you once, Shamus. Stay away from that girl. Who said so? Never mind. I'll get off the chase now before it's too late. It'll only mean. Go! Oh. Were you going to say. Trouble? The big guy was 200 pounds of unconscious as I bent over him. A heavy camel hair coat was wrapped around him. The same guy I'd seen before. I unbuttoned the coat, figuring some identification might help, only when it came open, I didn't need any more. He was wearing a tailored starched jacket. It wasn't the kind you see every day. It was white. That gave me the lead I needed, and I headed fast for my car. Ten minutes later, I stopped at a drugstore on my way out to the valley. I phoned the lion and told him to check on Farthing. Then I headed the car out Cahuenga. The pass was crowded with home-from-work traffic. It took me 25 minutes to make Ira Del Road and the home of Ward Hamilton. This time, the Dalmatian was out for the night. But Ward Hamilton wasn't. He opened the door. Well, well, Mr. Regan, come in. You work late. Our time clock's out of order. Oh, perhaps you'd like one for Christmas. No, thanks. Wouldn't fit in my sock. <laughs> well, Mr. Regan, I take it by this visit that you have good news for me. Call it that. You know who's been sending the girl those gifts? A guy named Smith. Uh, how's that again? Smith, Ernest Smith. His birth certificate says. I'm afraid I've never heard of him, Mr. Regan. He saw Mary in the waiting room of Farthing's office. Never met her. Shy little guy. Well, now isn't that something... Well, I must say, Mr. Regan, you did a remarkably fast job. There's something else you ought to know, Hamilton. Chances are Farthing's a phony. Mr. Farthing? Looks like. Why, it, it seems absurd. Just thought I'd let you know. Want me to go on with the case? Mm, what do you mean, Mr. Regan? I found your guy, Smith. That's what you hired me for. And when I get to Farthing, he'll sing like a prima donna. He'll sing? Talk. Well, then keep going. Okay, Hamilton. It's your money. It's your life, Mr. Regan. Be careful. I made a fast phone call to the lion on my way back into town. And that tied it up. Farthing was working late when I got there, only when he looked up and saw me, he wasn't happy. What do you want? Conversation. A lot of it. Mr. Regan... I must ask why you've come to my office at this hour. I told you, for conversation. Then I may regard this whole thing as a sort of joke? Maybe. Only the laughs you'll get wouldn't get by even on television. I demand an explanation of your attitude. Fair enough. Start with your name. Not Farthing, it's Farnham, Howard Farnham. Hmm? You want more? Uh, where did you get that? I had a phone conversation with my boss. He's got ways of getting things. Like your record... Five arrest bunco, one arrest forgery, one arrest fraud. No conviction. You were lucky. Maybe you won't be this time. You haven't got anything on me, Regan? How about blackmail? Not a chance. Maybe not yet. Only you were getting set for a job. I believe the guy's name was Hamilton. You can't prove it. Well, it was your mug, the big guy in the white jacket. He meant business. Does he do your legwork? Uh, listen, Regan, you can't pin blackmail on me. Sure, maybe I had ideas, but I don't claim I'm a doctor. I don't hand out any pills. Just advice, Regan. That's all. Just advice. That's too bad. You know, there are a lot of people that take phonies like you seriously, Farnham. A lot of people that could use advice. Real advice. Mine's real. They say, uh, should I marry him? And I say, yes or no, depending... On how much there is in it for you. What do you want from me, Regan? Who paid you to put the B on Mary Winter? Never mind, Farthing. You won't have to answer that. Come on in, Hamilton. I've been waiting for you. You're bragging, Mr. Regan. It made sense if I could get you to join Farthing and me. You might have something to say. You're showing up. Check my story. What story? Like this. man named Hamilton's supposed to look out for a young redhead named Mary Winter. Only Hamilton takes one look at this number and suddenly he's not fatherly anymore. He decides to move in for himself. It's absurd. Is it? You convinced the girl she couldn't trust any man in the world but you. 
Should have been the other way around. You're the one she couldn't trust. Isn't that right, Farthing? Leave me out of this, Regan. I run a legitimate business. Leave you out? Well, that wouldn't be fair. You were the guy Hamilton came to with money. He paid you to tell Mary Winter who's the man for her. Am I right, Farthing? You're lying, Regan. No, no, I'm not. Everything worked fine until along came a nice, shy little guy with an umbrella, Mr. Smith. Met Mary in Farthing's waiting room, starting sending her presents. You know, that must have really stopped you, Hamilton, trying to figure out who was cutting in on your Romeo act. Regan, I've had enough out of you. I thought you were getting nosy. You hired me to find the guy, and I did. And a story. Except if anybody should happen to tell Mary Winter what kind of a guy you really are, Hamilton. You might suddenly find yourself out of a lifetime career. You'll never tell her, Regan. I'll see to that. Forget one item. For a last touch, you send Mary a threatening note. Really put the pressure on. You're washed up, Hamilton. This revolver says I'm not, Mr. Regan. Well, then, come over here, out of the way. We're going to take care of Mr. Regan. Self-defense, not a chance with Farthing's record. Am I right, Farnham? Do as I say, Farthing. Go ahead, Farnham, go ahead. Murder will look good on your list. I... I won't play ball, Hamilton. I told the girl what you wanted, but I'm not in this. It's your fight. I can make it yours. Don't try it. I am as good with this gun, gentlemen, as I am with a whip. Farnham, watch out. Farnham ducked as I hit Hamilton's wrist. The bullet buried itself in the desktop and the gun hit the floor. I got the gun as Hamilton moved in fast. Only what he got for his trouble was the barrel across his head. <laughs> Farnham crawled up to his chair and sat down, puffing. I let him catch his breath. When I waved the gun in his direction, he didn't mind phoning the police. The heavy guy in the white jacket showed up bright and early for work the next morning, and the cop greeted him with a pair of handcuffs. He got off with assault and battery, and Farnham, alias Farthing, made the blotter for a light charge. Hamilton wasn't that lucky. His read assault with intent to kill. It was noon when I got to the lion's office. He was admiring the Christmas tree stuck in the corner. And from the sounds that came out of his mouth, it looked like his holiday fever was becoming serious. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the king of... Oh, hello, Jeffrey. They're looking for a replacement for Vaughn Monroe? Jeffrey, how unkind. It's the season for song. Sunday is Christmas, my boy. And today is payday. Uh, <coughs> so it is. Hmm. Well, perhaps I could manage a small token, a, a sign of my gratitude. Thanks. Yeah, by the way, uh, what about Mary Winter, the car hop? How is the girl, Jeffrey? Oh, I left her with Smith last night when I went after Farthing's mug. Jeffrey, you didn't. Alone together? And that girl hating all men and that boy shy backwards? Jeffrey, how could you? How cruel. It's too late now, Lion. Maybe we'll read about it in the afternoon paper. Double murder. Double hamburger. <laughs> what did you say? I drove by Mary's drive-in this morning. There was a car parked there. Jeffrey, you mean... Little guy behind the wheel. Trench coat, umbrella. He looked an awful lot like our boy Smith. And then you talked to them? For a minute. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Tell me, Jeffrey, tell me. What did Mary say? She said, with or without onions. Merry Christmas, Lion. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced by Sterling Tracy, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for Jeff Regan, Investigator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was me, lady. Who's you? Freeze, mister. Don't turn around and don't move a muscle. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Death in the Dark.
While the Norths are peacefully asleep in their Greenwich Village apartment, two men are working feverishly in a warehouse on the east side just before dawn. One of them holds a flashlight, while the other applies a large metal bar to the hinges of a heavy black safe. Coming, kid. You'll be popping in a minute. Need any help? No, I can make it all by myself. There she goes. I'll give you that can opener. The spring are good. It won't take much longer, will it, Lenny? I mean... Take it easy, kid. Can't rush this kind of a job. Uh, Put some of those tools away if you want to keep your hands busy. I'll be through in about ten seconds. What's the matter? You thought I heard somebody coming. Uh, But being so jumpy, that was me. No, it wasn't. It's the watchman. He's coming. Quick, douse the light. I'll get over by that door and smack him as he comes in. Got a belly, ain't you? Yeah. I'll give it on good. Watch it now. He's coming. Who's in there? Come on, answer me. Who's in there? I'm warning you now. If there's anybody in here, I'm gonna... Oh. Okay, kid. Now we have to work fast. Get this box out of here and take it down to the car. There's dough. In it. What about him? Never mind the watchman. Just do like I tell you. Get the dough out. I'll clean up around here and meet you downstairs in five minutes. Okay, okay. I'll be waiting for you in the car. Yeah, sure. You little punk. Never take him on the job again. Oh, my head. Stay where you are, mister. Keep your mouth shut. I don't like watchmen. You, you were in here all the time. I said to keep your mouth shut. You won't get away with this. You won't get out of here alive. I won't. Oh. I'll get out of here alive, all right. Only you're going out in a basket. Homicide, Lieutenant Wigan speaking. No, no, not yet, Sarge. Oh, not a thing. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. North are in my office. Okay, I'll get back to you later. Uh, that murder last night has got the whole department in an uproar. That watchman's murder on the east side? Mm-hmm. They dropped it in my lap at about 6 o'clock this morning, and I haven't been able to come up with a thing except this. Well, what's that, Bill? The murder weapon. The guy that cracked that safe last night used this on the watchman and then forgot to take it with him. What is it, Bill? A sash weight? No, no, it's part of a sectional, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. What in the world is a sectional, Jimmy? Oh, have you ever seen one? Oh. oh. It's a tool that's made for burglars. It's like a like a crowbar, only it splits up into three sections so it can be carried in a grip without being seen. Huh. I never knew there were tools that were specially made for burglars. Oh, there's plenty of them. And they aren't easy to come by either. This one was made by a pro. Do you know who made it? Well, Pam, I'm not sure, but I, I got a pretty good idea. It's got the same markings and workmanship as a Jimmy we picked up about two years ago. Belonged to a thug named Newsel. A safe cracker? Uh, one of the best. Well, then that should make things easy, Bill. If you know who made this Jimmy, all you have to do is arrest him and you got the murderer. Well, it isn't as easy as that, Pam. The man who made this Jimmy didn't rob that safe last night. How do you know? Because I sent him to jail about six months ago. Well, then he's gotten out. Uh, That's it, Bill. Uh, This Newsel man has broken out of prison. He couldn't have, Pam. Why not? Because I sent him up for murder. He was electrocuted the day before yesterday. Get away from that window, kid, and sit down, will you? I want to pay you off and send you home to your mother. I ain't got no mother. You know that, Lenny. A joke, a joke. I was making a joke. What's the matter with you, kid? You got no sense of humor? Well, I don't know anymore. After what happened last night, oh, I forget don't... it, Willie. It's all over. It's not all over for me, Lenny. Don't you understand? He's dead. The guy's dead. Won't walk no more. He won't speak to anybody. He won't ever see his family again. How do you know he's got one? I read it in the paper. He, he's got a sister. He's got two kids. Oh, will Marcia. you shut up? I'm sick and tired of you whining all the time. I can't help it, Lenny. I can't help thinking about him. Poor old guy, I keep seeing him lying there. I can still hear him moaning when he went down. Why did you hit him so hard? I didn't. I just tapped him on the side of the head like I showed you this afternoon. Okay. That was some tap. Paper says skull was broken in two places. But I didn't do it, honest Lenny. You know I wouldn't kill anybody. I just wanted to be a big shot, go along with you on a big job. I didn't want to kill anybody. Frank, 
<laughs> you get off that one note and start picking up your money. You got 600 bucks coming to you. I don't want it. Don't you see? I'd go crazy if I had that. No, I'd give myself up. Cut it out, Frankie. Give myself up. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> What are you doing? You gotta behave, kid. <laughs> no, no more, please, no more. All right then, hang on to yourself. You start cracking up, we'll both be in the soup. I'm sorry, Lenny. You ought to be. Remember, next time you start losing your head, I'll knock it right off. Darling, you do know where you're taking us, I presume. Why, of course, Jerry. I got the address of Bill. Whose address? Mrs. Newsell's. And who is Mrs. Newsell? Don't you remember, dear? The man who made that sectional Jimmy. Hmm? He's Mrs. Newsell? No, dear. He's the one who went to the electric chair. Mrs. Newsell is his widow. And what do you expect to find out from her? Oh, whatever we can, if she's willing to talk. And if she's real talky, she might tell us something about that jimmy that was used last night. How would she know? Well, her husband made it, didn't he? And maybe she knows who he sold it to. Say, that's an idea. Only I doubt if Mrs. Newsel will do any talking to people like us. <laughs> oh, we don't have to be like us. So we can be two other people. Who? Two thugs from Detroit. Uh, we're safe crackers. And we need a new set of tools. Oh, so naturally we went to her. Naturally. Uh, come on, Jerry. We're in the market for a sectional jimmy. Oh, all right, dear, that's enough ringing. If anybody's home, they certainly will. Oh. Yeah? What is it? Mrs. Nozel. Who wants to know? You in... Insurance man? Oh, me? Huh. That's a good one. <laughs> Tell her who I am, Sadie. Tell her yourself. It was your idea coming here. Coming here for what? Look, honey, my name is Fegan. Muggsy Fegan. This is my tomato. Pleased to meet you. What do you want? Well, ain't you gonna leave us in or something? Your husband's an old buddy of mine. We've done time together. My husband is dead. Yeah, I know. We... I heard the sad news yesterday. And it happened so sudden. We didn't get a chance to send flowers. What do you want, mister? Um, we just done a hot job in Detroit, and we had to pull out fast. Uh, so we dropped our, um, our can openers in the ditch. What's that got to do with me? Well, we can't do nothing without no can openers, so we thought you might fix us up. Are you kidding? I don't handle any of that stuff. Don't you even have a couple of odds and ends lying around the house? Not a thing. I got rid of all my husband's junk a year ago. Where? Who, who'd you sell it to? Nobody. You must have sold it someplace, because one of them sectional jimmies was used on a job last night. Yeah, that warehouse job. On the east side, where that watchman was killed? That's right. The police found a hunk of that jimmy right next to the body. How do you know? Well, we get around. Well, start getting. You know too much for me. Now, wait a second, honey. The police get around, too, you know. And if you ain't going to be friendly about this, I might just take a notion to call them Eat up it. and... Oh, look, baby, I got to know where we can find Eat you. Eat it, I said. Well, I... Oh. I didn't know you was going to say it with a gun. Come on, Sadie. Yeah. We'll get that Jimmy in the five and ten. <laughs> Well, how are you, Flo? Crying my eyes out. On account of the old man frying? On account of you never get around to see me anymore, Lenny. Well, I've been kind of busy lately. So I heard. I understand you were kind of busy last night on the east side. Hmm? I want to see you, Lenny. When you coming over? What did you say about last night? You want me to talk about it on the phone? Well... No. Then when are you coming over? Right away. So you think I'm in trouble, huh? Well, what do you think, Lenny? Did you ever hear of a guy named Muggsy Fegan? Mm, nope. Neither did I. 
That guy was a phony if I ever saw one. And so was that dame. Well, what are you worried about? They can't prove nothing about that, Jimmy. They can prove my husband made it. And if they start snooping around, they might find out I gave it to you. Who's going to tell them? You? I might. Ah, uh, uh, you wouldn't do a thing like that, honey. After all, I'm an old flame of yours. You're an old flame of a lot of people. It's you're the only one that counts, baby. Sure. I count up to about five grand, Lenny. What are you talking about? Five grand. That's what I want to keep my mouth shut. Your mouth can be shut for a lot less than that, baby. Is that a threat or a promise? How do you want to take it? In cash. I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking about you. If you don't watch your step, there'll be another funeral in the family. I think you're bluffing, Lenny. I'm not bluffing. You're asking for the moon. And you're going to pay it. This ain't just a safe-cracking job, Lenny. There's a murder rap that goes with it. Not for me, there ain't. The kid done the murder. I still say five grand. By tomorrow morning, other phones start ringing. Okay, baby. You'll get it. You'll get just what you're looking for. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Wigan speaking. Hello, uh, Bill. Uh, this is us. Uh, we're in a phone booth uptown. Both of you? Pam, you're all over my shoe. Don't get it mine. I'm talking. Oh, uh, are you there, Bill? Uh, yes, ready and waiting. Uh, well, uh, you won't have to wait much longer. We practically got the case all solved. Fine, fine. Where do I send the wagon? Oh, now, don't be facetious, Bill. You remember that Mrs. Newsom? Yes, roughly. Watching her apartment ever since we were over there this afternoon. Get to the point, dear. This is the point, Jerry. What is the point? That we were watching her apartment. Oh, and about a half hour ago, a big thug went in there and came out again. He stayed about 20 minutes, Bill. Jerry, please. And when he came out, he was plenty mad. But that is no, Bill. We followed him back to his apartment. And? Uh, well, there isn't any and yet. We called because we didn't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Go home. Oh, now, You're wasting your time, Pam. Just because you happen to see a thug go into somebody's apartment is no reason... it wasn't just somebody's apartment. It was hers. And if this thug is the one who used her crowbar... Jimmy. Well, what difference does it make as long as we know his name? It's Gorman, Bill. Lenny Gorman. That mean anything to you? No, but I'll check on it. Well, you don't sound very excited, Bill. Well, frankly, Pam, I, I'm not turning handsprings. About our leads, we just won't. We just won't call you anymore. Oh, well, now, Pam, I Goodbye, Bill. Uh, Pam, Pam, I. Oh. Who is it? Me, Lenny. Frank. Wait a second. Okay, kid, come on in. What'd you call me for, Lenny? What's up? Sit down, kid. Well, what is it? Something's wrong, isn't there? They got a lead on us. They found out about something. Will you sit down? I'll tell you all about it. Well, go ahead and tell me. What are you waiting for? For you to calm down. Now, listen, kid. I know how you feel about what happened last night. If I was in your spot, it'd be the same way. It's a rough deal killing a man. What do you mean? Homicide. It's a rough deal. When you're young like you, you got a chance of beating a larceny rap at all kinds of angles. Not with murder. They give you the seat for that, whether you're young or old. Lenny, what are you doing to me? What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to give it to you gradual, kid, so you'll understand what I'm driving at. Now, you got work to do. Work? You want me for another job? Something like that. I won't do it. I'm all through to you here. I won't do you'll it. You'll have to do this job, kid, whether you want to or not. Unless you're ready to go to the chair... Why? What's happened? Somebody found out about you. Somebody that feels like talking to the cops. Who? A dame. Besides me, she's the only one in the world that knows you killed that watchman. You gotta take care of her before it's too late. I don't get you. Take care of her how? Show you how. With a brand new forty-five. Lenny, you're just kidding, ain't you? You don't really want me to kill somebody? You gotta kill this dame. 
She wants a million bucks for keeping her mouth shut, and you can't pay it. Don't you get me? She'll tip the cops. Why? What's she got against me? Nothing. That's just it. Nothing. If you don't cough up 5,000 bucks, she sends you to the chair, just like that. I don't care. I don't care. Do you know what it's like, Frankie, when you're up there in the death house, I mean? You think you got it bad now. Wait till they start getting you ready for that chair. Getting you ready? Sure. They got to get you ready, kid. They got to shave your head and the hair and your legs. While they're doing it, there's a priest in your cell saying prayers. I don't want a priest. You will then, Frankie. You'll want a priest then more than ever. Because you'll know what you're going into. You'll know that there's something waiting for you at the end of that hall. And once you sit down in that, you're never going to get up again. You're never going to see nobody. You're never going to even breathe except that one last time when they give you the juice and it squeezes out of you. Oh, it hits you like a bomb, kid. If you wasn't strapped in that chair, why, you'd bounce all over the place. Let me Is that go. what you want, Frankie? Is that what you want to go through? No, no. All right, then. Take this gun and do like I tell you. Well, don't blame it on me, Jerry. Blame it on Bill. If he had had the decency to come over here when we called him, we wouldn't have to be doing this. Well, we don't have to do it anyhow, Pam. After all, there's nobody forcing us to sneak into Lenny's apartment. Well, I've got this window practically open now. Yeah, there she comes. Do you want to go first, or, or shall I? I? I'll go, dear. Just give me a boost. Right. This is enough? Fine. I-, I can make it now. Can you? I don't know why not. Yeah, there we are. Why, oh, I can't see in here. Yeah, here, take my leather. Thanks, darling. See anything now? Not very much. Is this the living room or the bedroom? Yeah, I think it's both. Well, y- you look through the dresser, Jerry. All right. I'm going to try that closet. If this Lenny man robbed that safe last night, maybe we'll find the money. Well, I haven't found any money yet. All I see in here is winter underwear. Well, the closet's practically empty. No. No, it isn't. Jerry, come here. I found something? I'll say I found something. Look at this. What is it? Don't you see what it is? It's the other two pieces of that sectional jimmy. Now, if we can only prove that they all fit together. Oh, guys, what was that? That was me, lady. Who? Don't turn around. Just stay right where you are and don't move. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Come in, kid. Come on in. Thanks. So Lenny didn't come with the money himself. He sent you. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a lucky thing he sent it with somebody, because I wasn't bluffing. No, ma'am. All right, son, where is it? Let me count it. Yes, ma'am, I got it right here in my pocket. Well, give it to me. Don't stand it. Put that gun down. I can't. I gotta do it. Don't be a sap, kid. If he told you... No, to... don't come in here. I gotta do it. You don't? There ain't a reason in the world... Please but... don't say no more. Please, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to know you. But you just can't kill... No, me. no more if you say another Stop word. Stop it, kid. Don't put... Ah! <laughs> Hey, what's the idea of frisking us, Lenny? We ain't got no guns. Well, I'm just making sure, mister. When I find somebody going through my apartment, I like to be careful. Now, what's the idea? Uh, uh, no idea. Uh, we just blew in from Detroit, and we're looking for some burglar tools. In my closet? Come on, open up, sister. Ain't you the two phonies that was over to see Mrs. Newsel? Phonies? And you never heard of Muggsy Fegan? Luck, wise guy. Ain't got time for fooling around. Who are you? What's your racket? I'm telling you, safe cracking. Okay, you asked for it. Now, come with me. Where are we going? Come with me, I said. I'll tell you all about it. Jerry's going to take us for a ride. No talking, see? Just open that front door and get a move on. Okay, okay, we're moving. Then move. Straight down the hall and out the back. Just a minute, Lenny. Huh? Oh. Here, I'll take that gun for you. Yeah. Yeah, stay where you are, Lenny. 
I'm a police officer. Bill, how'd you get here? Well, you told me where you were, didn't you? I pay attention to phone calls. But you weren't going to pay... Well, I happened to look up Lenny Gorman's record, and it interested me. Especially the part about safe cracking. What are you talking about? You ain't got nothing on me. Well, we have. Bill, he's got the other parts of that sectional Jimmy right in his closet. You're a cuckoo. Take it easy, Lenny. Mrs. Newsom might be able to give us some information about that. Yeah? I don't think Mrs. Newsom will do any talking. Well, we'll see about that. Come along, all of you. I sent some of my men over to her apartment, and I want to find out what they picked up. Ah, oh, now, easy now. Just try to take it easy, Mrs. Newsel. I'll get the doctor, Bill. No, 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 wait. The doctor's busy with that Frankie kid. Golly, what happened in here? That's what I'd like to know. You! You're the one that made him do it! You sent him here to kill me! Who? That Sherman kid, Frankie Sherman! You had the gun right up against me. No, no, Mrs. Newsom. you got to get hold of yourself. Can't help it. I was so close, I thought I was dead. Well, what happened? The cops. They, they got him in the shoulder before he could pull the trigger. There was one of them at the door and another one on the fire escape. Riley, Haynes, where are you? In here with the kid. You want me, Lieutenant? No, no, stay where you are. I'll be in a second. Well, we were just coming out anyway. The kid's going to be okay. Good. Yeah, I'm going to be fine. Why didn't you finish me off and be done with it? Watch what you say, kid. They'll use it against you. What do I care? They got enough against me now to put me in the Shut electric... up, you sap. Quiet, you. Let the kid talk. What do you want me to say? I tried to kill her and I couldn't make it. Why, Frankie? Why did you try to kill Mrs. News? Don't answer that. You got a right to have a lawyer. Keep out of this, Lenny. He can have a lawyer any time he wants one. What good is a lawyer? He can't do nothing for me, not where it hurts inside. Look, I killed a man. There ain't a lawyer in the world that can make him live again. You killed him? Last night in the warehouse, I killed a watch. Frankie! He was coming in while we were cracking the safe, and I hit him with a blackjack. Well, I didn't have nothing to do with it. I wasn't anywhere near him. Weren't you? No. I was standing over by the safe. He's the one that killed him. You better study up on your law, Lenny. What are you talking about? You can't pull me in on a murder rap. I didn't even touch him. I'm not so sure about that, Lenny. What happened after Frankie killed the watchman? Well, nothing happened. We just grabbed the dough and beat it. Wait a second, Lenny. We didn't grab the dough. I took it down to the car myself. You came down later. I thought so. Who cares what you think? I do, Lenny, because I've been thinking the same thing myself. Now, according to the autopsy report, that watchman was killed with a heavy bar of steel, part of a sectional jimmy, not with an ordinary blackjack. Not with a blackjack? You mean I... I mean he was struck several times, heavy blows with a big steel bar. But I only hit him once. I only hit him on the side of the head. Lenny. What do you want? You did it, Lenny. You killed him yourself after I was out of there. You killed him and you made me think I did it. Go on, you're crazy. You did. You killed him. You almost got me to kill her. Look out. I won't. Look out, you lousy dog. Hey, stop it. Stop it. Now let me go. Let me choke the wife out of him. Hands off, I said. (laughs) You don't have to get even with him, Frankie. The state will get even for you. Say, Pam. Uh, yes, dear? Whatever happened to that piggy bank I had up here on my dresser? Um, uh, piggy bank? Now, you know I've been dropping quarters and halves into that thing for a long time. Oh, uh, well, uh, when did you miss it, Jerry? Right after we got finished with all that safe-cracking business last night. Oh. Say, hey, you didn't happen to get an idea and break into it, did you? Well, um... As a matter of fact, Jerry, when the laundry man came this morning... Oh, I see. Uh, but I was going to put the money back, dear. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I hid the bank. I didn't want you to discover it. Say I... no more, darling. I understand everything, except for one point. What? Well, that piggy bank doesn't open until the whole thing's full. How in the world did you get the money out? Oh, that was easy, Jerry. I used the sectional Jimmy. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. 
This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example, America's popular all-round mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in a matter of seconds, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as smaller quantities of other leading brands. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. And now your Rexall family druggist brings you transcribed another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, if you have a little corpse in your home, swap it in for something useful. Mr. Diamond? Yes? I'd like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little heart. One hundred a day in expenses. My name is Raymond R. Walter, an attorney at law. Would you mind coming right over to my office? Will you have a retainer ready? By the time you get here. Where is here? 758 East 45th Street. Just sign the check and I'll stamp in the amount with my track shoes. Then I can expect you. You could even clock me. Who knows? You may witness the first four-minute mile. I quickly bounded over to the sink, pulled out a bundle of soaking laundry, grabbed a straight razor that looked like it had been used to hack out shrapnel, applied the Brillo to my overnight beard, and 20 bloody strokes later, I observed myself in the mirror. Wounded, sire, but not dead. By 11 o'clock, I was standing in the reception office of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. I looked for the secretary, but none was to be seen. Then the door of Mr. Waldron's inner office opened, and a man about six feet tall, sporting a heavy black beard and thick horn-rimmed glasses, stood facing me. I suppose you're Mr. Waldron? Yes. Uh, take this chair, if you will. Thank you. Now, uh, what's your trouble? Oh, not mine. My client's. You see, I'm supposed to give you $100 as a retainer until you speak with my client this evening. Uh, before you wave the bills around, tell me something about your client. My ethics get so double-jointed when someone shows me money. My client is a she. Hmm. Well, you certainly present the beginning of an interesting argument. Her name is Miss Mary Bellman. Miss? 28, blonde, showgirl, very attractive. Hmm. Ah, uh, so she killed 30 members of the volunteer fire department. I like tough cases. She's in fear of a life, Mr. Diamond, and since I'm her attorney, she called me and asked me to hire a good detective. You said Miss Bellum was in fear of her life. Uh, somebody trying to kill her? I think it best to let Miss Bellman tell you. She has all the facts. Uh, here's her address, and here's your retainer. She expects you at eight. It was close to 12 when I got back to the office and spotted my landlord nailing up my door. His eyes dropped blushingly down to his waist when he saw the two months back rent in my hand, and he hurriedly explained his carpenter work on my door as a delayed April 1st joke. I paid him off as the last board fell and then left the building and went to my flat on 53rd Street to take it easy until that evening. By 7.30, I was dressed in my best suit, the gray one that stands out from the rest because the rest are one brown gabardine that even a starving moth would gag on. Suddenly, I remembered my dinner date with Helen... So I put in a fast call and told her butler, Francis, that I'd be a little late. Then promptly at 8 o'clock, I walked up to the door of Miss Mary Bellman, prospective client. Yes? Who is it? Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh. Come in. Have you got it? Well, I don't know. Got what? Look, how about the envelope, huh? Envelope? Envelope? John said it would be in an envelope. But if you don't have it in an envelope, just kindly give it to me. Then I'll fix us a drink. Oh, well, maybe you better fix the drink first. This is it? some kind of a joke. Oh. What's the matter? What are you doing here? Who? Oh! Everything happened so fast, I didn't even have time to guess what it was all about. Someone belted me with the Chrysler building, and I went down like a loose ski in a snow slide. 
As I hit the floor, I felt a pair of hands pull open my coat and relieve me of my thirty-eight. The floor fell away, and I dropped into a deep black pit that smelled something like a dirty carpet. When I finally came around, it was like squeezing myself out of a starch diving suit. I got my eyelids apart, and there, standing in front of me, were two very good reasons for wanting to go right back to sleep. Oh. Well, he's coming around, boss. Good. I want him to see it when I give it to him. Oh. Slap him around so he comes to in a hurry. Sure. Come on. Oh. Wake up. Wake oh. up, you hear me? <laughs> No, okay. Come on, sit up. All right. Oh. Oh, my head. It's going to be your stomach in a minute. Full of slugs, you dirty, no good gumshoe. Oh, well. Oh, Louis Hall, huh? You slugged me, Louis? Why'd you kill her? Huh, Shamus? Why? Why? Uh, what? Mary. Look at her, Shamus. Oh, uh, where? Holy smoke. Yeah. My pretty Mary. Tell me why you shot her, huh? You think I shot her? You're gonna die anyway, Diamond. In a minute, I'm gonna kill you. But I gotta know why you done it to Mary. What makes you think it was me? The shotgun, in it? You got an empty shoulder holster. Well, that's your gun, ain't it? Yeah, I... Sure. Well, this is a gun that shot Mary. One slug gone. See the slugs in her. Oh, you got the wrong boy, Hall. Oh, knock him off, boss. He's lying. He done it. Shut up. Oh, sure, sure. I killed the girl and slugged myself, hoping that someone would come in and pin it on me. Boss, I think you're the... Yeah. Anybody in there? What's that? The U.S. Marines. Keep it quiet. Okay, Otis, use your pass key. If that doesn't work, use your head. Okay, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. The cops. Come on, Tony. We're getting out of here. Great, but what about the shamus? I don't want to knock you off if you didn't do it, Diamond. But I'm going to find out. Then maybe we talk more. Well, let's go. Let's go. Right. Out the back way. You mallet head. You've tried everything but your button hook. Well, I guess maybe we better bust it in, huh? Okay. Give me a hand. Put your shoulder against the door. Now, one, two. Hello, Walter. Diamond. What are you doing here? I came to see a client. We got a report on the homicide. Where is it? In the other room. Take a look, Otis. Yes, sir. How did you get mixed up in this, Rick? That's a pretty good question. Lieutenant! Yeah? It's a dame. It's the dress in high heels. He spotted them right away. Who is she? Name's Mary Bellman. Hey, who called you to come over? I don't know, but we traced the call and it came from a phone booth right next door to this building. How long ago? 8.15. Mm, right after I got slugged. You got slugged? Thoroughly. Otis, go call the coroner. Right. Let's see. One shot came right out between the shoulders. Yeah, when I came to, I could still smell cordite. Well, where's your gun, Rick? Well, right now, it's with Lewis Hall. Louis Hall, the gambler? Yeah, the guy who owns the Ace High Club. When I came to, Louis and one of his boys were getting ready to kill me for killing the girl. He waltzed out of here when you showed, took my gun with him. Maybe he knocked her off. Uh, maybe. Anyway, I think whoever did it used my gun. I still don't see how you figure in this deal. Well, a character by the name of Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law, called and told me to come by and see my recently deceased client. Come on. Let's see what we can find out about a Mr. Raymond R. Waldron, attorney at law. Well, I was in it up to my earlobes again. Walt had Otis put out a pickup on Lewis Hall and his torpedo. Then we climbed in the squad car and headed for the offices of Raymond Waldron. On the way over, I told Walt what had transpired since that morning. One, Waldron hiring me for Miss Bellman, saying he represented her. Two, seeing Mary Bellman in the strange way she had greeted me, as if she expected me to have an envelope for her. We got to the building, found the night watchman, went in, and in two minutes we were standing in front of the door marked 402. Isn't there usually a name on the door of an attorney's office? Usually. Maybe that's why I saw it there this afternoon. Now, uh, let us in, will you, Pop? Hey, sure, boy, but there ain't nothing to see. We know Mr. Waldron's not in, but we want to look around. <laughs> sure, boy. <laughs> look as much as you like. Reception room, boy. Where's the furniture? <laughs> Pretty dull looking, huh, boy? <laughs> uh, what about the inner office? Uh, no sense going in there. It's as naked as this. Well, it was all here this afternoon. Was there someone in this office this afternoon, Pop? <laughs> you think the boy's lying? <laughs> sure, like he said, some lawyer fella. Had all the furniture moved out, run out on a week's rent, too. Landlord's in an oxygen tent. <laughs> Your 
You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, brought to you by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall family druggist. Right now, here's a lady with a problem for him. Every summer, it's the same thing. My children either eat their meals so fast or fill themselves with all kinds of cold drinks and hurry-up snacks. And then we have our usual siege of what I call summer stomachs. Well, ma'am, a lot of mothers have that same trouble. And a whole lot of them have solved it with Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Why, how's that? Well, it's a quick and effective way to neutralize excess acidity and a remarkably gentle laxative. What's more, because of its special formula and exceptional purity, Rexall Milk of Magnesia has almost none of that unpleasant, earthy taste. Well, say, the children will like that. And because it's Rexall, ma'am, you know it's laboratory tested. All you have to do is follow the tested instructions on the label. Well, from now on, I'm asking for Rexall Milk of Magnesia. At Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Mr. Raymond R. Waldron had skipped, furniture and all. We thanked Pop, went downstairs, climbed into the squad car, and Walt checked into the precinct. He put a tracer out on Waldron and learned that Lewis Hall and his henchmen were yet to be found. The coroner's report of the dead girl, Mary Bellman, confirmed the obvious. Death by 38 the slug having been found in the wall. Ballistics had a full report and were waiting for the gun to show up. It was six to an even that Louis Hall still had it and that it was mine. On the way over to Hall's nightclub, Walt told me that Hall had been going with a girl named Willis, Jean Willis. And he was a little surprised when I told him of Hall's recent interest in the late Mary Bellman. It seemed that Jean Willis and Louis had been an item for nearly a year. In fact, she was working as a headliner in his nightclub. <laughs> What a dime. Yeah. Better not leave the doors open too long. The smoke will run out and the walls will fall down. I'm going to see what I can find out about Louie Hall, Rick. You want to try looking up Gene Willis? Meet you back at the bar. Rick, I'm on duty. Well, who said you got a drink? You've got on shoes, but you're not walking. Oh. Hey, Stapleton, sir? No, thanks. Now, where can I find Gene Willis? Your friend? I might be. I'm afraid, Miss Willis. Oh, oh, my goodness. I dropped $10. Oh, so you did. Eh, uh, looks a little messy. I uh, hate to see you dirty your hands, sir, so I just keep it and you can go wash up. Huh? Uh, washroom's right next to Miss Willis' dressing room. Right down that hall. I'll see that you're decorated by the Department of Sanitation. You. Name's Diamond, honey. I'm a private detective. Good for you. I hope you're happy in your work. Now beat it. I'm looking for Lewis Hall. He's out. Uh, down the street somewhere. Having your initials tattooed on the soles of his feet, no doubt. Look, Wiseacre. Blow or I'll yell and have a couple of boys show you the fastest way out of here. Honey, before you do, I think there's something you ought to know. Yeah? What? You open that pretty mouth of yours and you may end up swallowing a fist. Oh, Yeah. You know a Mary Bellman? What? Know her? Yeah, she works here. She ain't showed up tonight. Something happened to her? What makes you say that? Wishful thinking. Oh. You used to be Louis Hall's girl, didn't you? Yeah, until she came along. Now, look, what is this? What's going on? What do you want Louis for? You really don't like Mary Bellman much, do you? I... Yeah. She's all right. What would you say if I told you someone put a bullet in her tonight? What? Where's Louie Jean? Somebody took care of the little... Well, what do you know? Good. If Louie did it, I'm real happy. Because he found out what kind of a... No. I don't know where Louie is, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Now, get out of here. Okay, okay. But the law may be around to see you. Dandy. Now, beat it. Do me just one favor, will you, Jenny? What is it? Don't move. I want to remember you just as you are. Why, you crummy... You moved. Well, I went back to the bar just in time to see Walt look around the room like a shoplift on bargain day. 
Then he slipped the bartender a bill and downed a stiff belt with the speed of an alcoholic 30 seconds before prohibition was to set in. Good evening, Lieutenant. <laughs> that was a dirty trick. <laughs> I just saw the girl got nothing but a fast shuffle. I couldn't find out anything about haulers. Boy, either. Now, get your breath and let's get back down to the station to think about this thing. Let's go. Hiya, Lieutenant. Hello, pink eyes. Huh? Oh. Anything on the dead girl? Uh, here's the report. Thanks. How are you, Shamus? Fine, Otis, fine. Still under contract to the Museum of Natural History? That ain't very funny. Wait till they pick up your option and try to collect your head. Shut up, you two. Listen to this, Rick. This lab report says Mary Bellman was the one-time girlfriend of John Webb. Oh, the John Webb I sent up on an embezzlement rap eight years ago? The same. He got out a month ago. See, wasn't he suspected of being in on that Aetna payroll holdup? Yeah, but we never could prove that one on him. Hmm. The doll was never recovered either. No, but the roll of bills and the dead girl's pocketbook checked with the numbers and the bills from that holdup. Walt, I'm getting an idea. When I sent Webb up, he was pretty unhappy. Made a lot of threats to me. You got the serial numbers from that holdup? Here's the whole list. Well, check them with this money. Your own doll? Okay, but I don't get it. Notice, did you find out anything on Raymond R. Waldron? The, the guy that was supposed to be the attorney? Yep. Well, he ain't no attorney. He ain't even with the state bar, and I can't even find a Raymond R. Waldron in the phone book. Rick, where'd you get these bells? Huh? They check. You bet they do. Where'd you get them? Raymond R. Waldron. Gave them to me when he hired me. Otis, go get a picture of John Webb. Right. You think Waldron and Webb are one and the same? Waldron had a beard and wore glasses. It's been eight years since I've seen Webb. Hey, it fits. If Webb is Waldron, he's got a motive. For one thing, he'd love to frame you. Yeah, but we're going to have a hard time proving Waldron is Webb without fingerprints. Not only that, we're going to have a hard time just finding him. Uh, here you are, Diamond. Thanks, Otis. Uh, give me a heavy lead pencil, Walt. Right here. Hmm? <laughs> Get him, some artist. <laughs> oh, shut up, Otis, shut up. Now, let's see. There's a beard. Put some glasses on him. Uh-huh. There you are. Well, Raymond R. Waldron. Or John Webb with glasses and a beard. I'll put out a gem. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. I got an idea. Let's pull a real old stunt, huh? A real old stunt would be a cinch for us. Let the papers print a story that Mary Bellman is not dead. Webb must have made sure. Look, I didn't say that I was positive that Webb did the job. Louis Hall was standing with my gun in his hand. Gene Willis hated Mary Bellman for stealing her boy Louis, and ah, uh, we're loaded with suspects. Well, she did only have one bullet in her, and there is a possibility that she could have knocked herself off. Oh, stop sitting on your badge and call the papers. Say that Mary Bellman is in Bellevue in a serious condition. That due to an anonymous phone call, the police found her and rushed her to the hospital. I know, and she's expected to recover consciousness at any moment. Right. Uh, Otis, how would you look in a blonde wig? Huh? Come on, I'm going to put you to bed. Lieutenant! <coughs> Walt called in the reporters on the police beat and gave them the story. Then went over to Bellevue and set it up with the staff. All the rooms in one section of the second floor were emptied, and we took over 207. The boys came over from the station with a blonde wig, and Walt and I slapped it on Otis and tucked him away to go Betty by. A screen was put up in the back of the room, and Walt and I sat down behind it to wait. I've got six of our boys dressed as interns on this floor, and a policewoman on the switchboard. McCarthy is making like the night physician. If anyone tries to see Mary... Bless her little heart. He's to show him up. Tell them they can't stay long. The minute anyone shows, they'll call us on... Oh, that might be it. Yeah? A girl, Lieutenant. Nice looking. Wearing a big mink and carrying a handbag. Right. Girl. Gene Willis. Might be. Be here in a second. Keep well behind this screen. You can only stay a minute. I'll be outside. Thanks, Doctor. Mary... She's digging into her handbag. Let's take her. What? what? Let's have the... Sister. Take your hands off of me. Hang on for a Walt. What's the meaning of this? Ah, you hey. always carry a gun, Jean. Hey. She was going to kill me. Who's that? That ain't Mary. She was going to kill me, Lieutenant. Shut up, Otis, or I'll give her back the gun. You can't pin anything on me. I think we can, baby. Holy cow. 
Moore Company. Yeah? You can't do this. Dear, shut up now. Yeah. Okay. Moore Company? Yeah, all these gorillas. Said they were around. Louie. Oh, no. Honey, I no. warned you. Keep it down, no. lady. No. I won't let them get caught. I don't want them to get caught. Shut her up. I don't want them to get caught. Sorry, Louis. honey, but I, I have to. I don't want them to get caught. Okay. Uh. Lift her over behind the screen. All right. Yeah. There, there. All right, let me back there. Shh. Who's making noise? You can only stay a minute. Okay, Doc. You stay out here, Tony. Right, boy. Mary. <laughs> Mary, baby. I'll get the guy who done this. All right, Louie. <laughs> Who's there? The police and you're covered. Okay. Try anything and the guy in the bed will start shooting. The guy in the... Frank, give me your gun. Then, Mary, she's... She's... She's really dead, Louie. I guess maybe I wish too much. I ain't smart. Here's your gun, Shunks. You had the right gun, all right, but the wrong boy. Here, Walt, give it the ballistics. We got Jean Willis over behind that screen. She came up here with some crazy idea of protecting you. Janie, she think I done it. Yeah, the crazy kid. She ain't got no... It's getting crowded. Yeah? What's going on? Trying to run down a killer, Louie. Okay. A guy just came in. Mm. Wearing a beard? No, he asked what room Mary Bellman was in, and then let some flowers walked out. Uh, uh, oh, we better get that girl out of here. Get her out in the hall. All right. Come on, honey. Louie. Oh, Louie, yeah. I didn't mean to... I'll give you a hand, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant. The fire escape. Somebody out there. Oh, Louie, I only wanted to yeah. help you. I... Quiet. Don't move, anybody. Uh, Maybe without the light, he won't see us. Look out. He's going to shoot from there. Get that light. Who got him? I didn't even have time to get my gun out. I, I didn't. I was too scared. Well, I thought he'd at least get in the room. Lieutenant, you okay? Yeah, keep everybody out of here. Where'd you get the other gun, Louis? I only give you yours. Remember, Shump? Let's have that one, Louis. I done what I said I was going to do. I don't know who the guy is, but I guess he's the one to kill Mary. Can you see the guy, Rick? Is it Webb? Yep. Alias Raymond R. Walton, attorney at law and very dead. outfit, Helen, baby? Uh-huh. You like it? Make a silkworm lose his mind. <laughs> I fixed some sandwiches. Thought you could eat them in here in the study. Oh, beats the kitchen. How can I see what I'm eating? A moth would crack up if he had to land by one lousy candle. Thought it was kind of romantic. Soft lights, music. Oh, honey, honey, honey. My rear old stomach has been neglected all day. Food should make it happy. I hope so. Hard day? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm, what's this? Mm. Oh, very toothy. Peanut butter and caviar. You you make them? Of course. No. Yes? Walt, Helen, right there. Feeding his face. Wait a minute, Walt. No. Here's the way it breaks down. Walter nor Webb decided to kill three birds with one stone. On oh, a big pig. He wanted you for sending them up. He wanted Mary Bellman because she was blackmailing him. Seems she threatened to tell the police that he was the one who got that payroll. Oh, that's why she asked for an envelope. She thought I was bringing the payoff. Yeah. Well, Louis Hall was the third bird. For stealing Webb's girl while he was doing time. That's it. You've been a living doll. What are you eating? I think this one's cheese and liverwurst. <laughs> How are you going to sing? I hadn't thought about it. Me, 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 me. <laughs> You'll never make it. Don't bet on it. I will bet on it, a double sawbuck. I know you haven't got it, but you're on. Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-doo. I hear a polka and my troubles are through. Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop-dee-doo, hoop-dee-doo. It's got me higher than a kite. And me down with soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop-dee-doo in it tonight. When there's a trombone playing, I get a thrill, I always will. 
when there's a concertina. I always smile, cause that's my style. When there's a fiddle in the middle and it really is a riddle. Plays the tune so sweet that I could die. Lead me to the floor and hear me yell for more, cause I'm a hoop de doing kind of guy. Hoop de do, hoop de do. I hear a poker and my troubles are through. Hoop de do, hoop de dee. This kind of music is like heaven to me. Hoop de do, hoop de do. It's got me higher than a car. Hand me down my soup and fish. I am gonna get my wish. Hoop de do in it tonight. Now, honey, doing that phone. All right, Fatty. What do you got to say now? Didn't think I could sing with a mouthful of liverwurst. <laughs> it was worth the 20. I bet you feel awful. No, but I'm sure glad I wasn't eating spaghetti. Why? Well, I strained so much on that last note, I would have knitted a T-shirt for my tonsils. <laughs> Dick Powell will be back in just a moment. And now, once more, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's the time of year for a friendly warning about sunburn. Remember that overexposure may cause serious and painful burns. But in case you do get a sunburn, I want you to know about Rexall Gypsy Cream. You'll actually be amazed at the immediate cooling, soothing relief you get with Rexall Gypsy Cream. And what's more, it's not a messy ointment, but a quick-drying, greaseless liquid, easy to apply harmless to close. Ask for Rexall Gypsy Cream at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Ladies and gentlemen, Last year, a great part of America's security went up in smoke. When traveling this summer, you can guard against forest fires by following these few simple rules. Crush out all cigarette, cigar, and pipe ashes. Break matches in two before throwing them away. Drown all campfires twice before leaving them. And always find out the law before using fire in wooded areas. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Good night, everyone. This program was transcribed. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Statistics show that one woman in ten has an extra sensitive, extra tender skin. And for that woman... There's Caranome hand cream. For like all Caranome beauty aids, Caranome hand cream is hypoallergenic. Pure, mild, safe for most sensitive skins. It softens, beautifies, protects. Remember, for the woman in ten with sensitive skin... There's Caranome hand cream. Only one of Caranome's beauty aids designed especially for women with sensitive skin. Ask for Caranome at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Hear Juvenile Menace on Dragnet tomorrow night on NBC. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's getting pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. <laughs> Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Baron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50. Transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last just... trip down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, I, uh... because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is my... Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, huh? <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, why women we come... show funny tastes sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over ten pounds would pull her right out of the boat. <laughs> but now, what kind Listen, of a problem... she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing uh, talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. It... All right, now. Let's is get it... down to cases, huh? Oh, all right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. His name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Laura Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, he hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally she put in a call to the police. Who's your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him? Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat delivery, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could mm -hmm. Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? You know, you know she's very sweet, Charlie. She's a bit of a bore. But, oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Mm. Well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in the back of the building. What did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. Now, we'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barron. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Barron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. But I wondered, did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like Earl. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key, and I drove out there. Laura Baron was a fragile, gray-haired little old lady wearing steel-rimmed spectacles and with, well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes, he was so happy the day that picture was taken. He just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now... 
Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no. No, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no... No argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning. Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Ah. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he returned, Mrs. Barry? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I, I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years, we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions, but... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful, because he wasn't a sinful man. Polly was a good man, and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still he... haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. That... Always deep in my heart... Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Parley from us? Uh, <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth, and our Mrs. death... Mrs. Barron... They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well... And so... If my beloved Parley has been taken from us for some divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will... Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it, to... <sighs> chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other field. Where did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And to keep himself occupied. Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing. Though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long? For some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes. Who knows? But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, oh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me, but he left here almost every day to try his skill. And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Uh, Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. Sir. The inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole, I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but... Well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals, and... But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Brackett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said that he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m., and since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You kidding? We'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Eh, yeah, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock, you told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have? Oh, man, you are a funny one. You call <laughs> me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you case. know, fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. <laughs> well, she's different. You little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, 
A detective? Huh? Uh, go ahead and say it, an insurance officer. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you had just relaxed your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line... I wish it were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax, anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Barron will, will, well, will just come to you. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sure, sure, instead of you chasing Earl. Him. Huh? Huh? Up ahead, just to the right there. Where? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the Earl, sea Earl, look. And if the fellow that lost it look, knows... further far. over to the right. Huh? What is that floating there? I don't know. Well, it looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny. It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. That's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Yeah. Here. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's see. Oh. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny, it's poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. Well, this idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground. And the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Parley Baron Matter. Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable the body that Earl Porman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Barron, who had disappeared two days before. The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Will Bright's boat dock, where Barron's car had been left parked. I could just finish telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Baron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, uh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bryant? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Barron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? No, poor man. no sir. Why not, Mr. Bryant? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back here Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. 
That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in a thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman. Uh, Just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning him. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Well, I just noticed something about this tanker lying in the boat. Mm Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. I'd like to tell you what I think might have happened. Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No, no. He always wanted to go out alone. Yeah, but not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. But Barron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well. Have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up. So I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett, who was assigned to the case, had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on it. He gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny. Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed up case on my hands. The Parley Baron matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Not that much of you. Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Parley Baron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh? No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Baron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Baron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Byron take off in his skiff Friday morning alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch. When he got back to the dock, skiff was in. Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. He'd be taking an awful chance, wouldn't he? Well, how do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a chance. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So Will Bright mentioned. Also wasn't tied up. He was just sitting there. Oh, then you meant untied. No, I meant T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Johnny, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat? Well, have you checked on his dental work, things like that? I'm waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back there. You know, that's a funny thing. Why? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone, and according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least she wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Daner. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you stumped on a case, says Earl Foreman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches, no matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. <laughs> I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Dana? Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Dana. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Dana, from the Federal Bureau. 
the, the Federal Bureau... That's of... right. So you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you I'm are? simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. To Frank. Yes, only he didn't know I heard. And, oh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite despite the late hour. Sir, are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Sir, please, you'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar. First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, yeah, well, I... I can uh... hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances. Incidentally, our men in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you. You mean... There was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. Well, we didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you've a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you. Even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron. Yeah, right? that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the, uh, shall we say, cat out of the bag. That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came all by yourself. Uh, Mr. McLeod. Parley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up? Dressed in his clothes? Well, during the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gathered that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. <laughs> Well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that... did know that, huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Yeah. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were Mr. changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in... Uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. Well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly and everything it does... Oh, we try. Well, what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear up. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will that be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us. And we've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. 
Now, when an insurance claim is filed on Barron... Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. No, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the pension that some companies have for, shall we say, slow action on claims... Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Barron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Um, Shall we say, okay. And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report and, of course, delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character, the most beautiful girl I've ever met, and money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When October dies and the river wind takes over, Broadway is arranged in plots of crowd and coldness. There's a new quality on Broadway, shrill, having to do with top coats and early darkness and frosty sounds. And twilight is brief, a darting ebb of light and a sudden autumn chill and hurry, hurry, hurry to this place or that, home, or to a hot dog stand or to the neon that winks a promise. Hurry, kid, make a phone call, find somebody. It's night already. And it seems the night comes sooner in the tenement district, or somehow it never quite leaves, in the barrio, 
in Spanish Harlem. That's why the people gather together sooner and start their music earlier in a small nightclub like La Cantina, where I was, and Detective Gomez was, and the man who led us across the floor. Through here, senores. Down these steps. He's in the cellar. You were the one who found him? See, si, I went down here to my store bin to replenish the beer for my customers. He... Well, you will see. Is there any other entrance to this cellar than those steps we just came down? You will see, senor. Look, don't make a drama out of it, Luis. Just tell take us... Take it easy, Gomez. There, and the beer cases stretched out, wet, dead. Now, tell us, Luis, how did it get in here? Puffing, senor. You see a window through which deliveries are made from the alley. Mirror, the window is broken through, so... Well, take a look in the alley, Gomez. Okay. You know who he is, Luis? See. Si. Is Ricardo Miguel, the boy who lives near, the boy who works at the pastelaria, Arsenio Loca, uh, the bakery shop, also not far. Oh, stabbed. Four places that I can see. Is the floor show, senor? Be gone. Yeah. It is sad you cannot take the time to see, senor. It is exciting. It is sad you are not the time. Beating against the cellar tomb containing a boy's death, the rhythm clack of a woman's high heels, dancing in measured frenzy, to a nimble passion plucked from a guitar, to the percussion of men's applause, to the olays hoarsely whispered deep in the throat. The light bulb sways to it, the shadows dance, and the huddled boy shrieks his stillness. <laughs> And into it after a while, Gomez with information. There were bloodstains in the alley outside. The boy had been knifed there, had fallen or was pushed through the cellar window. Leave Gomez to the official gathering of the dead. Walk a barrio street to the bakery of Senor Lorca. Try it. Find it closed. Then walk some more. Scavenge the barrio night for scraps about the murdered boy, about Ricardo Miguel. And from an alley wall, moist with autumn's night mist, a form detaches itself whispers into your ear that Ricardo loved a girl much. Reina Martinez lives alone in a room on 110th. Alone. Try her, senor. Go there to a numbered room in a tenement hall. Try. Good to me. The night is good to me. I'm from the police. You bring yourself to the wrong door, senor police. Go skin your knuckles in another place. You're Reina Martinez? The barrio woman spit my name at you because her man looked at me? The boy was stabbed, Ricardo Miguel, murdered. Because he loved Reina? Let's talk about it inside, Miss Martinez. In a little while, a boy comes for me. To buy me wine. To take me dancing. I have not combed my hair. I have not painted my mouth. Another time we will talk inside. Now, Miss Martinez... Tell me about Ricardo. I told what there is. He loved me. He was knifed in an alley. We found him in a cellar. Maybe you can tell me why something like that had happened to him. You will not mind if I make myself ready for the boy who comes for me, eh? I fix my hair for the flower he always brings for it. Ricardo Miguel, let's get back to him. Ay, pobrecito. Poor boy. Poor dead boy. You like my hair so? It won't matter at headquarters. <laughs> so impatient, senor police. All right, I tell you. Then I will tell you, Ricardo. Tell me. He worked with me at Lorca's Pastelaria. He baked little cakes, little pastries. And in between, he spoke love talk in my ear. Sometimes I listen. Often? When he bought for me little things, I listen. You know, jewelry, silk blouse. This that I wear now, he gave to me. I made a promise when he brought it to me. No, I cannot keep it. Poor boy. That's all there is about Ricardo? He worked with you, loved you? And now he's dead. Sometimes it's the pattern in the barrio, senor police. Why should Ricardo be... Donald! Mono, little monkey. Who is he, Reina? Oh, the police, Mono. I have finished with him. You like Reina? How she looks for you? What does he want here? A boy was murdered with a knife. A boy who loved me. Ricardo, the pastries. What do you want with her, mister? What's Reina got to do with it? She just told you. 
When was he killed? Maybe three hours ago, more or less. Who are you? Donald Jordan. College boy with an alibi for Raina. Three hours ago and a sack full of hours before that, Raina was with me. It took that long to show her the ducks in Central Park Lake. That's where you were, Miss Martinez? Donald told you. My mono told you. In other words, you're each other's alibi. Mm Mm-hmm. Each other's. Come to Raina, Donald. Come on, little monkey. Ven. Ven aquí. Come on. Then watch him move toward her, stop. And the girl considering him, and the gesture, her hand sleeking her black hair before she went into his arms. And see a thing, her eyes open, looking over his shoulder and out into the night. And turning to the boy, smiling to him, kissing him, her hand smoothing her hair again, and her eyes watching me as I left. The next morning, back to the barrio, back to the front footage devoted to tenements and window watchers and the people of the doorsteps and the chalk talk. Back to the place that had been closed the night before, the pastry shop of Senor Lorca. Buenas dias, senor. Good morning. I am sorry, senor. Sorry about what? This morning, my stock, it is uh, scarce. However... Because I... Ricardo didn't show up for... My baker Ricardo is muerte, dead. So for the next few days... I know. I... I'm from the police. See. Si. You know that Ricardo was murdered, don't you? Seguramente. Of course. Of his dying, I know all about. Oh? See. Si. It has been told all around the barrio. I see. I need some information. I want you to help me. Seguramente. Why not? I want you to tell me all you can about Ricardo and about Reina. Of Ricardo, a boy who bakes pasteles, who lived alone and baked between the hours of nine and five. Excellently. Who I will miss. How come Reina isn't here this morning? I will ask her the identical question when she will come in. Was she here yesterday? Uh, for a time. Then a young man took her to look at ducks. Such a girl as she to look at ducks. Loco. If you would see her, you would... I've uh, seen her. But then you understand. Is there another such one as she, senor? I ask you this because in your profession you must go about the city and see women sometimes of exquisiteness. Yet I do not believe you have seen such a one as Reina. The face of her, the form... You married, Lorca? In truth, senor, and because you are of the police who enjoy to listen to truth... I wait for Reina to grow up to enjoy me. Then I will be married. Quite a few men seem to be in love with their locker. Ricardo, for instance. See, si, for instance, Ricardo. Why should anyone want to kill him, Marco? Quien sabe, I shrug. Shrug to denote I do not know. I do not know. Why, indeed? Uh, another question, Senor Police? No, no, that's all for now. Uh, gracias, Senor. Gracias. Adios, mi amigo. Hey, old fellow, and well met. Top of the morning, Danny. We said good morning to each other a couple of hours ago, Gino. Off the dime. What have you got? What I've got is what you're going to get. To wit, a report on the college youth, Donald Jordan, even as you requested. Okay, okay. Detective Gomez told me that this Jordan youth is a student at McKay College. That the dean of men whom he questioned told the good detective that this Jordan youth is indeed bright, a gold star student. And found out that this Jordan youth was indeed free to watch ducks yesterday afternoon because he had only morning classes. I see. Well, what have we got on Reina Martinez? Reina Martinez, to wit. According to our files, it seems this Reina Martinez has been a caller at our pokey on various occasions. Once on the occasion of clawing the eyes of a fellow female. Once for waving a knife under the nose of a brush salesman, and another time for carving her initials with a like knife into the epidermis of a friendly barfly. Knife, huh? Yeah, from what you told me of her, Danny, from this Reina Martinez, nobody would mind. What's a knife prick from a girl like you that? You gave me a thought, you know. I'll go ask her.
What does this girl look like, Danny? You'll see. Come on. This house. One side, friend. Take it easy, Buster. What's the hurry? I said one side. He's a big one, Danny. Okay, friend, you asked. Yeah. Come on. Come on, settle down. It's a lot better, young fella. I ask you something. What's the hurry? You guys crazy? Take your Why hands. Why were you running? In a hurry, I run. Police. Huh? Police officers. Look, I didn't have anything to do with it. To do with what? Look. Bring him along, Gomez. Come on, kid. Did you come out of this room? All right, we'll see. Inside. You heard him in. Yeah, I see. I didn't do it. I swear, I swear I didn't do it. I didn't kill it. I didn't kill Ray. I didn't kill it. I... You are listening to Broadway is My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Say, that was some night the gang gave Jack Benny last week when the spendthrift squire surprised them all by inviting them not to a nightclub on him. And the surprise finish, the gang will be waiting for Jack for sure tomorrow night. Yes, Jack Benny, Mary Livingston, Dennis, Phil, Rochester, Don, and tomorrow night, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Listen for them all on CBS Radio. There's fun every minute. <laughs> The winds of October begin their departure from Broadway, and departing leave in their wake the gutters choked with regret, the corridors echoing lament. And Broadway picks through the leaving, searches for lost treasures, for images misplaced, left behind in that movie palace, forgotten in the sudden realization that this was your subway stop. There was the girl with the soft fur held close to her throat, covering her face right up to her eyes. The way she looked at you... It was one you'll remember, kid, right through the fall season. And there was that late time on Broadway when the bar was closing. And the guys with convention buttons on their lapels bought you a drink, said, whenever you're out my way, look me up. That was October, the image and the farewell. So why look for anything else, kid? That's all there is. Except a girl dead in a room you've been in before. Except a sobbing protest. I didn't protest. kill her. I didn't kill her. Except the scream of a radio. Shut that thing off, Gomez. Yeah. Nothing I can do about that, Danny. It's down the street somewhere. Look, I told you I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, you told us. What's your name, kid? Garfield. Bobby Garfield. Rain and me, we were just... What do you do, Bobby? I play football. Let me tell you, huh? Rain and me were just... You're a just... football player, huh, Bobby? I like football. I play for McKay College. I'm a sophomore. They brought McKay me College, here. huh? You know a boy named Donald Jordan, Bobby? Yeah, I know him. Same fraternity. Look, what is it with you guys? You gonna let me tell you how it was? Sure, Bobby. Go ahead. Tell us how it was. Rain and me, just kind of good friends. You know what I mean? Uh-uh. Tell us. What are you guys twisting it into me for? I didn't kill her. You act What'd like... What'd you do with a gun, Bobby? Throw it away. Let me tell you, huh? Rain and me... I met her right after I came to New York to play football. She saw me play once. Came up to me after the game. Said I played so good, why not celebrate? You're telling us how you didn't kill her. That's why you tried to run away, huh? Because you didn't... We were dancing, see? Kind of dancing to that music you turned off. You can still hear it. We were dancing to that. All of a sudden, there was a shot. I guess from where that window's open to the alley. All of a sudden, rain had just dropped out of my arms and there was blood on my shirt from where she... Uh, see it? Uh, look, I gotta call somebody. I gotta call somebody on the telephone, sir. Sure you do. We got a phone at headquarters. You can make your call from there. Put the cuffs away, Gomez. We won't need them. You've got a gentleman caller, Danny. Huh? Who? A gentleman who comes in answer to Bobby Garcia's phone call. Oh, show him in, Gino. Uh, this way to see Danny Clover. Oh, that'll be all, Gino. How do you do, sir? Very well, thank you. Uh, sit down. Uh, 
My name's Clover. Douglas, sir. John Douglas. Bobby Garfield called you. Bobby's in a lot of trouble. The trouble, Mr. Clover, is a thing youth is prone to generate for itself. You and I understand that. The trouble is murder. Now, sure. May I ask, Mr. Douglas, why Bobby called you? Of course you may. Didn't you know? I'm a football coach. No, I didn't know. Bobby comes under my tutelage as an end, an excellent one. McKay College's pride. Offensive end, of course. Of course. What else about Bobby? What else about him? I found him in New Mexico. Prevail upon the McKay regions to make his way to New York easy. They certainly agreed with me. He's very fast, is Bobby. <laughs> Got a speed racing the super chief across the New Mexico deserts, I tell sports reporters, for color. He was found running out of a room where a girl was shot to death. This, sir, is confounding. I told my squad, I keep telling them, no dates until after the season. So, surely there must be a mistake. Bobby listens to me. There's no mistake, Mr. Douglas. Who is the girl? One of those flirts from Greenberry School across the river, I'll wager. Reina Martinez, a barrio girl. Of course, if there's um, anything... Well, what am I expected to do? Answer another question. Do you know a McKay student named Donald Jordan? No, he's not football. I wouldn't know him. Uh, I still don't know what I'm uh, expected to do about this... Uh, this altercation that Bobby has gotten himself into. Just talk to him, Mr. Douglas. He's under suspicion of murder. He asked for you. Of course. Oh, you'll pardon me, sir. Thank you. And watch the leader of men go talk to one of his boys, not knowing what to say, not knowing how to pep talk a boy out of a grief the coach had never played against before. And imagine it. The pat on the shoulder, the voice modulated to the acoustics of a cell. Then the curiosity taking over finally, gentle, insinuating. Tell me about it, son. Tell me about the girl. Tell me what there was about her that made you... Then wipe the smirk off your mouth because you've asked these questions, too. We'll go on asking them. And because you're a policeman, ask them with the official stamp of approval... Of anyone, of an employer of the girl now dead, of Senor Lorca, for instance. I told you, Senor, I told you of the exquisiteness of Reina. That she is dead does not change my philosophy about her. Where there is such as Reina, there is such as death. You kill her, Lorca? Listen to me, Senor. Listen very closely. How could I lift my hand to Reina except to... How? This way, with a gun in it. Then shoot her through a window while she was dancing with Bobby Garfio. That's how. Explain me. Explain me something. Why should I do this when I don't even know this, this Garfio? Bobby Garfio. He knew Reina loved her like Ricardo Miguel did. Someone found an alley where Ricardo was, stabbed him to death. Then saw Reina in the arms of Bobby Garfio. Shot Reina, killed her. Watched Garfio being taken to prison. It all worked out real good for a man like you, a man who says he loved Reina, a man who Reina didn't love. I tell you something, senor. All this that you said, I could wish it, wish it deep inside here. But I could not do it. I'm only a seller of pastries. I have not the, the, what it needs. Then you so... didn't know about Garfield. About dead Ricardo, my pastry boy, I knew. About the college boy who took Reina from me to show her dogs, quack, quack. Only these rivals I knew till now. I regret you told me about this Garfio. Oh, one more thing, uh, uh, Teatorne, I may speak to the phone. Go ahead. Lorca's pasteleria. Huh? Ah, a detective. See, there is a detective here. This is what you want of Lor Momento. For you, senor. Thanks. Danny Clover speaking. Danny, I disturb you only because Dean Crawford of McKay College phoned in and wants you to come to his office right away. Did he tell you why? He said he's got a shocker for you, but an immediate shocker. Those were his very... Thanks, Gino. Maybe I'll have to get back to you, Larka. So don't go away. <laughs> Did I say something funny, Dean Crawford? No, not you, Mr. Clover. I said something funny. I made the remark to myself. Oh? This week, Mr. Clover, just this week, 
I sent in my resignation to the Board of Regents. A thing unheard of. No dean ever quits at McKay. We get fired. I quit, effective the new year. And that's funny? Scandalous. To use a McKay term that's hardly ever used. And then, think about it, Mr. Clover. One of the students is involved in a murder. All in the same week. This is a black week for McKay. <laughs> I wonder about something. About what? Statistics. How many McKay boys have gone out into the world and committed murder? As still Dean of McKay, I'll match my boys against anybody. Look, Dean Crawford, you called me, said it was urgent. Suppose you tell me something urgent. I got a letter a while ago from a daddy. A daddy who is sending his son through McKay. He's a worried man. What are you talking about? The daddy of Donald Jordan. Worried about the bills his son has run up. No wonder. Menagerie, jewelry, baubles. For a sex we only mention in psychology, too. Female. The letter came after your Detective Gomez had left. How close was Donald Jordan to Bobby Garfield? I'll tell you how close. We have an arrangement here. Assign a football player to a scholar. Arrangement. Garfio was coached in his studies by Donald Jordan. This is known as intellectual freedom. Donald writes Bobby's themes, does his assignments, which leaves Bobby free to think about nothing. Admirable. What else can you tell me about them? Which one of those rascals do you think killed that girl? I asked you a question. I've told you everything I can, Mr. Clover. Well, McKay Semper Fidelio, as we always say. Don't you always say? No? I don't blame you. Bye, Mr. Clover. Bobby? Come on, Bobby, on your feet. What? What do you want? Let's go, Bobby. We're going for a visit. A visit? Yeah, we're going back to school. There's rooms on this floor, Mr. Clover, right across the hall from mine. He never goes to the bonfire rallies. He's probably in. This one. The most studious room in the fraternity house. Who is it? You, Bobby. It's me. Bobby Garfield. Bobby, I thought... Oh. Let's go inside, Donald. You sure? Gee, I'm glad to see you're out, Bobby. Yeah, I knew you would be. That's why I came right to you, so you could be glad. That's right, Donald. Bobby told me a lot about you on the way over here. I don't understand what you're doing here. We'll get around to it. I get bad news for you, kid. Bad news? Yeah. You remember something? The day we were inducted into this fraternity? What are you talking about? The day we put four fingers up in the air and gave the secret hand clasp and said the words? The second finger meant loyalty. You haven't been true blue. What did they do to you in jail, Bobby? You talk crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Frat boy. Crazy. Cut it out. Yeah. I'll cut it out. Pardon, I didn't have a paddle, fraternity brother. Is this how you police act? Bring a crazy man into my room and have him beat me up? I'm sorry, Donald. I told him a few things on our way here. I didn't know it would upset him this way. Look, I don't know what this is all about. Why don't we all go down to the bonfire? Sure. Sure, let's do that. It'll make a big impression, Bobby. You being out of jail, gonna play tomorrow. Come on, guys. We're going, all right, but not to a football rally. You're under arrest, Donald. What? Two crazy men. The policeman and me. What do you mean, I'm under arrest? For what? Well, what reason? Murder. Ricardo Miguel, Reina Martinez. You're kidding. Especially Reina Martinez. Now, there was a dame. Take my word for it, fraternity brother, there really was a dame. You talked about me, didn't you? You and Raina. Oh, we had a few chuckles. Whenever your name came up. You ready to go, Donald? What did you say about me? You know what we said. What you say to yourself. Leave him alone, Bobby. I didn't kill anybody, Mr. Clover. You killed one of Raina's boyfriends, Ricardo Miguel, to prove something to her. That she couldn't have anyone but you. That you wouldn't let her have anyone but you. You don't know what you're talking about. Believe me, he knows. 
Four fingers in the air. Ricardo Miguel was killed. You had an alibi for that. You were with Reina. That's right. She told you I was with her. She lied for you. She alibied for you. Because for an instant, she admired you. She did. She did. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Nothing. N- nothing at all. What are you laughing at? I laugh because I remember something. A couple of Saturdays ago, right after a football game. When Reina waited. Until I came out of the stadium. Came up and told me who she was. We celebrated the occasion. <laughs> You took her to that game, didn't you, Donald? I'm only sorry I didn't kill you two. You almost did at that. Who were you aiming at, Donald? Raina or me? While you were peeking at us from the alley. While you were... <laughs> Who were you aiming at? Raina. I wanted to kill her and I did. What she did to me. The things she made me do for her. The things I got for her. And she laughed. She laughed. The neon spins and Broadway blares out an eight-beat rhythm, the tempo of hunger in dance time. Grab yourself a dream and get with it. Close your eyes and pretend you're holding something special. Keep them closed. Dreams last longer that way. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Dick Crenna was heard as Bobby Garfio and Sam Edwards as Donald Jordan. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Marvin Miller, Lillian Baeff, Herb Butterfield, and Edgar Barrier. Looking for a lively date for tomorrow night? She's on the younger side, but her appeal is to all. Interested? Then meet Corliss Archer, CBS Radio's atomic teenager, with her fun-making gang on most of these same stations tomorrow night. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the Frankie Lane Show is your date with slick syncopation every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of A Thousand Violins, Almost. It began with a lovesick violinist whose mash notes all sounded off-key. Then I met a long-haired violin maker and his daughter, a girl with ambitions to play the harp. Only the prize guy was the one with the gun. He fixed it so I ended up playing second fiddle to a corpse. It was the kind of a day that when there's nothing left to do, you go get a haircut. So I settled down in Sam's barber shop up the street and waited for my number to come up. Instead, I got a cloud of three-for-a-dime cigar smoke. Anthony J. Lyon, my boss, puffed in. Aha! 
Yes. Oh, there you are, Jeffrey. I've been looking all over for you. Well, keep looking, Fatso. I'm in the chair next. Your hair good? Oh, that can wait, Jeffrey. We've got a new client. You want a detective or a sheepdog? <laughs> it's very funny, Jeffrey. I'll admit you could stand some trimming around the ears, but today I've agreed to help our client. He gets a tremin'. Jeffrey, how can you say such a thing? We must get back to the office at once. Mr. Rome is waiting. Mr. Rome? Hey, Charles Rome, a young violinist, very talented. Sure. Hey, that makes us brothers. Brothers? What on earth are you talking about, Jeffrey? Both long hairs. Come on, fatso. <laughs> I told Sam I'd be back later for the haircut, and the lion and I walked around the corner to our office. Mr. Charles' room was waiting all right. Tall, thin, blonde guy with long, skinny fingers that tapped along the edge of his chair. He was maybe 23. On the floor beside him was a black violin case. He looked nervous. Well, well, Mr. Rome, I told you I'd locate him right away. Hey, Mr. Rome, my number one operative, Mr. Regan. Uh... Oh, how do you do, Mr. Regan? Hi. Hey, Jeffrey, Mr. Rome here will tell you his problem, and I'm sure you can help him. Okay, Rome. Start at the top. Uh, yes, sir. Well, uh, you see, Mr. Regan, it's about Tina. Tina Lanier, my, my fiancée, she uh, uh, returned my ring. That's your problem? Well, there, there's more. Uh, when Tina did that, she, she wouldn't tell me why. But I'm sure she still loves me, Mr. Regan, I, I'm sure. Another guy? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. She loves me, I tell you. Okay, take it easy. There's... There's one thing I ask, Mr. Regan. Follow Tina, talk to her, find out, but that's all. What? Uh, Jeffrey, Mr. Rome has already discussed this with me. Uh, he, uh, he's especially anxious that we limit the case to the girl and no one else. You, 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 you must promise, Mr. Regan, that there may be others, but you're to pay no attention to them. Just the girl. What are you selling, Rome? Jeffrey! Listen, Lion, I'm tired of buying half-baked stories from any client with a fee. There's more than I wanted. Well, I, I, I can't tell you any more than that, Mr. Regan. It's Tina I'm worried about. Yeah, that's the truth, Jeffrey. Our client... Okay, okay, our client. Only one of these days we're going to know what we're getting into first. All right, Paganini. Where do I find the girl? The tall, skinny guy wrote out an address on the back of a sheet of music paper. It turned out to be a small shop. Cracked white plaster, tiny black sign over the door out on Sunset Boulevard. Lanier's Music Appreciation Shop and Violin Repair Service. I parked the car and went in. It was old violins all over the place. Strings, bows, rosin, busted bridges, pieces of wood, jars of varnish. Amidst the debris sat a little man behind a battered counter. He was sad-eyed, curly-haired, and sixty. His fingers were carefully fitting two pieces of wood together. He didn't look up when I came in. There was a bell on the counter. Uh, uh, oh, oh, a customer. Please forgive me, but that's why I have the bell. I, I don't hear so good, and sometime I'm too deep in my work. You're Mr. Lanier? Yes, Antonio Lanier. It was La Conata, but you see, the name of Lanier, it's, it's much more American. Is your daughter in? Tina? Well, uh, Tina, she's... Uh, uh, hey, oh. Tony. Leave this for Nick, huh? Uh, Nick? Oh, yes, yes, Nick. Y yes, I leave it for him. Tell him it's a uh, good fiddle, and I want it fixed right. You got that? Uh, sure, sure, I got that. It, it will be fixed. Okay. You were going to tell me about Tina. Uh, Signor, I don't know why it is you wish to, to see her. My, if it's not too important, I suggest uh, some other time. Reason? Well, it's uh, something private. Also, Signor, Tina's not in. She's not returned from her harp lesson. Harp? Yes, uh, she's studying with the great Robert Olenger. He's very fine. Oh, Tina! I'm going to my room, Father. Tina, come here. I must uh, talk with you. It's no use, Father. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Now, leave me alone. Nice girl, Tina. Oh, Signora, please, you mustn't judge Tina too quick. She's a sweet girl, a kind of girl. It's just that, well, she's not herself lately. How long does she usually stay in there? Uh, who can tell? But tonight, tonight she will be out. Tonight is the concert. And this she does not miss. The Philharmonic, the fine music. What's the girl running from? Please, Signora... I'm tired, very tired. Perhaps we talk some other time. Please, you must go. The 
little man hurried out of the room and disappeared behind the same door his daughter Tina had slammed a couple of minutes before. Only when he glanced back at me, there was a different look in his eyes, far away, like he was looking right through me. Outside, the sun was setting behind a neon sign, only I didn't get to admire the view. A taxi pulled up and a slim, distinguished-looking guy, gray at the temple, stepped out. He was wearing white tie and tails, and like everybody else, he carried a violin case. He walked right past me without batting an eye and went into the shop. The taxi drove off and I headed for my car. But when I got there, I had a customer waiting. Only the thing he had in his hand was no violin. It was a knife. You know me? You're the guy I left the fiddle for Nick to fix. That's right, Maestro. I'm the guy. Get to the point. You're playing the wrong tune. You can talk plainer than that. Sure, but I'm a musician. I prefer to put my message in my own idiom, if you get what I mean. You play the knife? Oh, no. The shiv is just protection. I play the cello, maestro. And I'm telling you to join another orchestra. Tina Lanier doesn't want you hanging around. End of composition, maestro. The guy with the knife waved a quick downbeat in my direction and disappeared. I headed for home and a shower and some concert-type clothes. An old double-breasted suit and a shirt my laundry claimed was white. I just finished a quick shave when I heard somebody playing boy drummer on my door. I opened it. Oh, uh, may I come in, Mr. Regan? Why not? You've got a musician's union card. Charles Rome, double-breasted suit and white shirt, but no violin case, sat down. He had something on his mind, but from the look on his face, it didn't add that he was anxious to go into it. I washed the shaving soap off my face and dressed while he sat. That's when I got an idea. You dressed to go out? Why, uh, uh, yes. Concert? Uh, y- yes, Mr. Regan. How, how did you know? Well, you and Tina used to go to concerts together. We used to. You're going tonight, hoping to see her. Well, that's true. Uh, but, Mr. Regan, I came to see you about Tina to talk to you. Go later. Have you got a season ticket? Oh, t- to the concert, yes. Next to Tina. You bought them together. Well, it was before we... we... Okay, I, I got news for you, Rome. It's going to be a big evening, only you aren't going to be there. Oh, but, 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 Mr. Regan, it's my chance to see Tina, to, to talk yeah, to her. Yeah, there'll be talk, all right, but you won't be in it. But, but, but Give I... me that ticket, Paganini. I got a date with a lady who plays the harp. It was a big night at the Philharmonic. Crowds in mink and earrings, starch shirts and top hats. And the rest of us in the balcony. I found the seat Charles Rome had bought and settled down to wait for Tina Lanier. Ten minutes later, she showed up. She sat down next to me without looking right or left, and things began to happen. A tall, slim guy, gray at the temples, full dress, came out on the stage. He took a bow, and the audience calmed down. Then I recognized him. The guy I'd seen going into Antonio Lanier's violin shop. I took a quick look at the program, but I didn't need it to know the guy with the baton was Robert Erlinger. Tina's harp teacher. Tina Lanier sat there with her eyes closed and listened to the music. But I had a job to do. I nudged her arm and she turned with a start. Her eyes blinked and then she recognized me. What do you want? Talk, sweetheart. Leave me alone. Why did you ditch him? Who are you talking about? Charles Rome, your fiancé. I won't answer that. You might be smart. I know what's smart. Go away. Quiet, please. Rome's got a right to an explanation. He got his ring back. Who are you, anyway? Jeff Regan. I don't know you, Mr. Regan. Leave me alone. Quiet, please. Okay, sister, it's your life. Only Rome isn't going to like it that way. Maybe you'll want to know about the man with a knife at your place. What? Yeah, the little guy who carries a shiv. Long, sharp. Charlie Rome might be interested. You saw him? You saw me. I don't like knives waved under my throat. If you won't be quiet, I'll call the manager. Mr. Regan, please, tell Charles. Tell him I'm sorry. That's all. That's all there is. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. Now, go away. So my talk with Tina Lanier got me nowhere. Except the fact that somebody was putting the screws on somebody else and it didn't add up to a broken engagement. What it did add up to was a lot of violins. 
I thought about that as I headed for the little red sign that said exit. I made my way past a couple of frowning ushers to the alley outside. When I got there, it was dark and empty. Me and a couple of bottles and torn ticket stubs. I walked out toward the street and then stopped. Somewhere in that alley was somebody else. Maybe behind the fire escape. Maybe behind a big poster. And then I was sure... Okay, maestro. Get your hands off. I told you, maestro. Knife again. Yeah, the shiv, maestro. Sharp steel on this blade. And there's enough to make you look like a bag of confetti. What's Tina Lanier to you? It's not your business, maestro. I told you to stay away from her. I told you it was off key. Now I'm going to show you just what a... Knife... The mug folded into a heap on the alley. He could trade in the knife any time. He wouldn't need it where he was going. I headed out of the alley toward where the shots came from. There was a cab driver at the curb waiting for the concert crowd, and I grabbed him. Only he saw nobody and said nothing. The guy who put the slugs in the cello player was gone. I headed back to my car and hopped in. Now I had to have answers and have them fast. Jeff Regan was too close to a killing not to have a lot of it rub off. It was going to be me and a murderer, or the police. It started when a lovesick violinist hired the lion and me to find out why his fiancée, Tina Lanier, gave him the go-by. But it ended with me and a corpse in an alley beside the Philharmonic Auditorium. The corpse was a mug who wanted me to stay away from Tina. I'd first met him at a violin repair shop out on Sunset. And that's where I was heading now. To Lanier's Music Appreciation Shop and Violin Repair Service. Owned and operated by Tina Lanier's father. It was close to nine o'clock when I got out of my car, went inside, and rang the bell on the counter. A medium-sized, sharp-looking character with a pencil-lined mustache came out from the back room. Yes, sir? Lanier in? I'm sorry, sir. The shop is closed for the evening. Okay. But tell Lanier I want to talk to him. I'm afraid you misunderstood me. I said the shop was closed for the evening. Look, Mac, this is business, and I don't mean fiddles. I go tell him what I said. Very well, if you insist. Oh, uh, by the way... My name is Nick, not Mac. The suave gentleman named Nick went back through the door. A couple of minutes later, Antonio Lanier shuffled out to meet me. He was wearing an overcoat, and even in the dim light of the shop, you could make out tears in his eyes. You wish to see me, senor? Yeah. I wonder perhaps if you could wait until tomorrow. Well, that's pretty important, Mr. Lanier. Yes, I suppose it is. You see, I have to go out. It's important, too. Uh, maybe I better tell you something. There's been a murder. Murder? Yeah, a little guy. I saw him in your shop today. He left a violin for Nick. Yes, yes, I know. You know about him? I know he was killed 30 minutes ago, senor. The police telephoned to tell me. You mean that... That's correct, senor. The man with the violin is dead... And my daughter, my daughter, Tina, has been arrested for murder. Antonio Lanier walked out of the little shop, and I watched his bent shoulders as he shuffled off down the street. Then I realized what had happened. Tina Lanier had followed me when I left the concert. That meant she'd gotten to the alley just after the shots were fired. She could add the rest easy. A couple of ushers, maybe, hearing the shots, had run out and found her. That was enough for the police to take her in for questioning. Well, there wasn't much I could do until morning, so I headed home for some sleep. I dreamed about a group of excited figures all talking to each other. Only when I looked closer, they weren't people. They were violins. The next morning, I drove down to the police station... Lieutenant Candid, Homicide Squad, was at his desk. Now what's bothering you, Regan? The Lanier girl? Well, I can understand why. Cut it out. I've seen some lookers in that cell, Regan. Remember the Pendleton dame a couple of years ago? 
Some woman. Chopped up her husband with an axe. What about Tina Lanier? Remember the Carlton woman back in 39? There was a dame. Red hair, green eyes, legs. <clears throat> what was it she used? A letter opener? Ice pick. Oh, yeah, ice pick. Oh, I hated to see her go, Regan. Gas chamber? Not guilty. She's married again. Millionaire. Which brings us to Tina Lanier. Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Maybe not the fire that Carlton woman had, but not bad. Get to the point, Candid. What have you got on her? She killed a guy, Regan. We call it murder. There's more. Sure there's more. There's always more. Like? Like she was found standing over the guy. Guy's name, Joe Fenton. Petty crook, knife artist. San Quentin boy, Regan. Did a year in 1945. That's no motive. You know something else? While Fenton was in prison, he played cello with the San Quentin Orchestra. Cute? I'm still listening. Okay. How about this? Tina Lanier's been dating Joe Fenton for two months. The boyfriend. What? That's right. Got witnesses for that. Um, what's Tina Lanier to you, Regan? She was engaged to a guy named Charles Rome. Client. You betting on him? I'm not betting on anybody. I think you got the wrong customer. Oh, it's a drab job, Regan. Dames like Tina brighten up the place. You understand? Sure. I understand. Mm -hmm. See you around. Yeah, see you around. That gave me a lead. Joe Fenton, Tina Lanier. I headed for the office of my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. Only when I got there, I got another surprise. Sitting across the desk from him was Antonio Lanier. Violin case under his arm, circles under his eyes. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I've been looking for you. Mr. Lanier wants to talk to you. Well, that makes us even. Jeffrey, what on earth are you talking about? Mr. Lanier has retained us to clear his daughter, Tina. Mr. Lanier is a client, Jeffrey, a client. Is that right, Lanier? Yes, sir, Mr. Regan. Yes, sir, that's a correct. Well, then, maybe you'd like to talk now. But Mr. Regan, I... There's questions, Mr. Lanier, like... Like about Tina. Tina someday gonna be a fine artist. She will be recognized as a truly... Yeah, if she stays away from guys like Joe Fenton. Yes. Yes. Okay, Lanier. One more question. Who's Nick? What? Nick, your helper, the guy Joe Fenton left a violin for. Well, Nick... Uh, Nick is just as you say, my helper. I... Uh, I hired him uh, several years ago. Uh, hey, Jeffrey, why are you questioning ago? our client this way? Because we've got to get facts before we get a total. We were hired to find out why Tina dissed Charles Rome, and now she's got herself booked for a murder she probably didn't commit, and her father expects us to clear her. We can't go into this thing wearing a blindfold. Yeah, but Jeffrey, aren't we going to help Mr. Lanier? Yeah. Yeah, I'll drop him by his shop. Maybe if he gets his hands on a violin, he'll relax. <laughs> Lanier sat in the front seat as we drove out sunset. He didn't say anything. His tired little shoulders were hunched forward as he stared out of the window, watching the traffic. In front of the shop, he thanked me again and went inside. I started to drive away and then stopped. A cab had pulled up behind me and a tall, thin guy with graying hair stepped out. Under his arm, a violin case. Robert Erlinger, the guy I wanted to have words with. Dr. Erlinger, I presume. I beg your pardon? You got a minute? I don't know you. I know you. Uh, what is it you want? It has something to do with the murder. Your pupil, Tina Lanier, is on the hook. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was on my way to see Mr. Lanier to express my sympathy and to offer my services in any way. Okay. You want to help? A couple of questions. You play the fiddle? Mr. Regan. I play every instrument in the orchestra. Well, then why carry a violin? I was taking it to Mr. Lanier for repairs. Oh, you mind if I look? I don't see what possible interest my violin would hold for you. Well, just let me decide. Very well. But I must ask you not to handle it. It was beginning to make sense. A lot of separate strings, like on a violin... Only when you tune them, make the notes fit each other, and draw a bow across it, you get music. I headed for the downtown library and found a binding of all the issues of the San Quentin News, the prison paper, for the year 1945, the year Joe Fenton had dropped in. 
I spent two hours covering every page. And then I had it. The last note. Call it the lost chord. But it sang like a canary. I checked for my gun and drove out toward Hollywood. It took me 30 minutes in the nighttime traffic, and then I was there. Yes, so who is? Regan. Who? Oh, it's you, Senor Regan. I'd like to have words with you, Lanier. Well, Senor, I'm very busy. I'm doing a Russian job. Uh, so am I. So? Yeah, it's about Tina. Oh, well, then, of course, we will talk, Senor Regan. About Tina, I'm always willing to talk. Well, that'll save us a lot of trouble, Lanier. Yes, yes. Please, sit down here. Thanks. <clears throat> Got a little story for you, Lanier. Short story, but covers a lot of territory. Yes, I'm a listening, senor. It uh, starts with a guy and his daughter. A violin maker who put a lot of faith in his girl with talent. A guy who'd sell his soul to give the girl everything. Yes, that's, that's it true. This guy sold his talent for making violins. Sold it for a dough so he could give his girl harp lessons. Maybe. Seems this guy made a mistake once. Went to prison for it. Mistakes? We all make a mistake? Sure. Only the guy I'm talking about made another one. While in prison, he met a couple of musicians in the prison band. They had ideas. Used the guy's talent for making violins. Phony masterpieces. Take regular fiddles and doctor them up so they look like real dough. You... you know. I know. You sold yourself back up the river, Lanier. But Tina... Yeah. Yes, it's a true. My senor, such a talent. Such a talent cannot be wasted. The only Tina ditched a career in a nice guy like Charlie Rome for dough. Your mistake, Lanier. But she was not in her right to mind. She didn't know what she was doing. But you did. You killed Joe Fenton and your daughter's set to take the rap. No. No, I will not let her. Senor Regan, when you came in, I was thinking... Thinking all alone, with my violins beside me. I have decided. Tina will suffer no longer for my mistakes. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them everything. I'm going to... Lanier. I'm going to tell the police anything, Lanier. Medium-sized guy, pencil line mustache, gun in his hand. The guy I'd met the night before in Lanier's shop... Nick. Stay where you are, Regan. Ah, you're the other half of the team. You and Joe Fenton. Saw your picture about a half hour ago. That right? Library. Back copy of the San Quentin News. Picture of the prison orchestra. You and Fenton and Lanier. Oh, isn't that nice? Real nice. My picture in the paper. That's too bad Erlinger didn't see it. Before he let Tina talk him into bringing his violin here for repairs. Yes. I saw Erlinger's fiddle. A Guinarius worth about 50000 you used it to model from, to have Lanier make the phonies. Erlinger's a dumb cluck. He never knew the difference. Besides, he got his original Guarnerius back. Sure, he's dumb. That way. But so was Lanier. Quiet, easy going, little man. Probably would have lived to a ripe old honest age. You mugs hadn't dropped him. We just told Lanier what kind of a chance a man with a record had. We convinced him, Regan, he was better off using his brain for something lucrative. You mean you blackmailed him? You can call it that. He took persuading, but he's finished now. You just killed a guy. You're the one who's finished. Uh, not yet. Bad timing. Out of my race. Now we're even. Police. The nearest violin shop. Sunset. Yeah. Bring an ambulance. It took a week to patch up the hole in my arm, but... Antonio Lanier wasn't that lucky. He died, trying to do something right for his daughter, Tina. And maybe he succeeded. Tina Lanier and Charles Rome dropped in to see me a couple of days later. 
The scared look was out of her eyes, and even with the tears, there was something soft and warm. By the time I was in shape again, I needed a haircut so bad, even the dog catcher wasn't interested. And I figured my barber, Sam, could take the full afternoon for the job. Hey, what's the matter with you, Jeff? I never seen such a head of hair on a St. Bernard. Ah, busy, Sam. What do you mean, busy? A fellow with a soft job like you guys got no reason not to have his hair cut every two weeks, maybe ten days. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, here you are. I've been looking all over for you. Hiya, fatso. Hey, Jeffrey, what's the idea of not showing up at the office? Just because you got a little bandage on your arm doesn't mean you can take a week off. You gave me the week off. I did not. Oh, yes, oh, I did. He caught me in a weak moment. Oh, well, that makes us even. Beat it, fatso. I'm getting a haircut. Yeah, so I see. Needed it, too. Well, when you're finished, Jeffrey, I want you to report to the office at once. We've got a client. Client? Yes, big oil man from Texas. Lots of money. Seems as though he met some man on the street one day. And they Sam, had words about some oil stuff. turn the chair and around. Well, oh, thing, Jeff. Yeah, that's delay. better, Sam. Well, huh? you got time for shampoo, Jeff? Nothing but time, Sam. Give me the works. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mike. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could take help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but the evidence was against you. Yeah, sure, if you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Janet, like... what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girl's just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get her some water, honey, quick. Yeah. Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet. Drink this water. Janet. 12, 15. I, I just discovered I went and told him the thought he would... Uh, oh. Mike. Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah? Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now, remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard-hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, I guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. 
If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called the doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past 12. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go that. ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but, well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him, or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no, not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing, and she isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? she... Can't she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She... She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. See, you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Oh. I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. And the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and trial of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes, excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay, sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell? Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect the check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case is cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Ann, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty verdict... It wasn't was no... suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. She was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. Sir. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Janet found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. 
I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shorties in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing. Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. I Bauer! Mean... Now I remember. Remember what? Well, I was in the outer office this evening. When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer! Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop! Hey, Inspector, what? what's wrong? He's running for the front door! He's running. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. Three twenty-seven. Not much fellow here. Mike, that secretary Bauer, he was tied into this somehow. Mm -hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, I'll leave that problem to Faraday, you know. Well, the place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey. A bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Oh, every one of them with its top or oh, this cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jack... That she had the diamond. Well, somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No. That guess that that's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Yeah. There's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah. Somebody else found it too. Drawers yanked out, everything's a mess. I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Huh? Put in my thumb and pulled out a plum with a big girl and I. Yeah. A check, two and a half. Mm -hmm. Paid to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by... Well, I'll be a... Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. And that's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not... $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, stuff this in your purse, Angel. We're about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shh, Miss Russell... What? Hmm? Somebody's at the door. Look, snap off the lights. Yeah. I'll flatten against the wall. I'll jump him when he comes in. No, no, Mike. 
All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. I got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. Anne? Oh, Anne, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? Are you in here, Anne? Oh, so you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Anne. Phyllis, uh, give me that check and note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? $2,000. Th- and what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl. And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Uh The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? How dare you? You, you, uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible oh. you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. Yeah? I've got to see you at once. What? Where are you? Listen. I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see. It's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Bauer wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who was listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. What time is it, Mike? 10.28. 10.28. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us, like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggone times to bust loose. Well, I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? 10.29. I don't know. This may be a trap. Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, he's passing you. Mike? Hey, Bauer! 
Hey! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he yeah. hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. That's a waste of time, Inspector. Look at the back of his head. Oh, guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake. 12.15. 12.15. Mike, remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. Twelve fifteen. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then then what? Go take a good look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, this is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window... The window. What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, fellas, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack Holmes. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay. Climb in. Here, darling. Come in. Thank you. I turns this corner here, see? Mm -hmm. And I'm moseying along when I spot him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stopped right about here. Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh, gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard. Now, come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. 
You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to twelve, but the reflection looks like a quarter after twelve. Thirty minutes difference, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear. You ain't gonna pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're going to pick up three passengers, and one of them is the murderer. Here we are, folks. Here's the office. Right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they had the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Ann. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock, and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell... The killer knew he was trapped, unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Shh, please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, is going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three... This is fantastic. Four... Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kid. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Oh. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murder. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But hmm? I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, <laughs> I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. <laughs> that was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Mm -hmm. Oh, now, listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, Phil, let's have it. Well, no, Mike no. had a date with me for 6 o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, and no, no. And guess what his alibi was? What? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with five pounds of potatoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following. 
June 4. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Put that gun down, you little fool. Shut up, Mr. North. Be careful, Jerry. Listen to her, Mr. North. She's making a lot of sense. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denny. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Diamond Noose. Apartment 4B, 24 St. Anne's Place, New York, is occupied by Mr. and Mrs. North. Mr. North is a publisher. Apartment C, in the basement of the same building, is occupied by Samuel Ryan and his son Skip. Mr. Ryan is a janitor. An apartment on the sixth floor and an apartment in the basement. A publisher and a janitor. How could the life of either of them ever affect the other? Pam! I'm almost ready. Oh, darling, the Wilsons are expecting us at six, and it's nearly that now. Zip me. Where? Back. Thank you. Mm-hmm. How do I look? Oh, peachy keen. Come on, now let's go. I need something. A hug and a kiss? And must my dress? Hmm. Just a kiss, then. No mm-hmm. hug. And smear my lipstick. I know. What? What I need. The necklace Aunt Harriet gave me. Oh, but it's in the safety deposit box at the bank, dear. Uh-uh. I brought it home when I went to the bank this morning. Uh, will you get it out of my jewel box for me? Okay, but we've got to get going. Oh, stop fretting. We'll be at the Wilsons in plenty of time. Pam! What? It isn't here. The necklace? But it'll be silly. Of course it is. Now, see for yourself. But I distinctly remember putting it... Oh, no. Oh, no what? Well, I I took it out later to try it on. Now, let's see. What did I do with it? Oh, Pam, that necklace is worth... I wanted to see how it looked in the soft light, so I went to the mirror in the hall. Then the telephone rang. It was Ethel Wiley, Wiley, dear. She's just back from Europe. Pam! She had a wonderful trip. Italy, France, England... Aunt Harriet's necklace, Pam. Where is it? On the telephone table in the hall. Oh, Oh, Pam, dear, let's, let's not be so casual about it, huh? I'm sorry, Jerry. Okay. It was right here. You, you're sure of that? Positive. What? Darling, it's been stolen. It, it couldn't have been. But it has. Has there been anybody in the apartment today? No. Well, then it's... It... Wait. Yes, there was someone in here, Mr. Ryan. Ryan? The, the janitor? Well, I was out at the grocery store. He let himself in to fix the faucet in the kitchen. Well, well, at least the faucet wasn't fixed when I went out, and it was when I got back. Oh, but Ryan, he, he seems like such a nice old guy. Oh, I can't believe that he'd... Oh, now, now, Pam, you, you you must have put the necklace somewhere else. But I didn't, Jerry. Darling, if that necklace isn't right here on this table, Mr. Ryan took it. Uh, well, then I, I suppose the only thing to do is call the police. I guess so. Okay, now... Uh... Oh, no, no. Now, look, there's something wrong. I I just don't think Ryan would do a thing like this. And before I call the police, I'm going down to his apartment and talk to him. How about it, Hody? What do you think it's worth, huh? Oh, I don't know, kid. A couple of bills, maybe. Two hundred? Is that all? I'll say three on the outside. Where'd you say you got it? One of the apartments in the building, 4B, people named North. Pa made me go up with him to help him fix a faucet. I saw the thing. It was just laying there, so... Gosh, Hody, you sure we can't get more than two or three hundred? Why all of a sudden such a big urge for dough, Skip? I want to get out of here, Hody. Get a joint of my own like you did. I can't stand it anymore, the way Pa's always yammering at me. Go to school, study hard, make something of yourself. (laughs) Don't be a bum like your brother. 
You know what it's like, Hody. Pa put you over the same jump. Yeah. Look, Hody. Would you let me move in with you? Now, hold it, kid. Just for a little while, Hody. Just till you and Jackie get married. <laughs> you want a 99-year lease, huh? What? Skip it, Skip. No, oh, no, wait. Well, what's the matter with you and Jackie? Nothing's the matter with me. Ain't you getting married? Not that I know of. But when I saw her over at her old man's store the other day, she talked like what you... What Jackie and... talks like and what I do is two different things. Now, let's drop the subject, huh? Sure, sure, Hody. Okay. Now, about this necklace. Let me take it and see what I can do. Oh. Duck the necklace. Take it. Skip! Stay in here, Pa! Skip, did you sweep down the back step? Well. Hiya, Pa. What are you doing here? Skip called me and asked me to come Skip, over. Skip, go to your room. Oh, Pa. You heard me! But I... Go on, kid. See you later, Hody. Sure. I thought I told you that you're not welcome here. So I'm going. Out the back way. I put all the garbage out the back way. You're getting to be a real humorist, ain't you, Papa? Hody. Yeah? I'm telling you for the last time. Stay away from Skip. Leave him alone. You're dirt. You're scum. When you make dirt and scum out of everybody you touch. If you weren't my old man, I'd beat your ears off. You draw the line at beating your father? This surprises me. Ah. Jackie, what are you doing here? I was over in my father's store. I, I thought I recognized your car. What do you want? Want? You haven't called me for over a week. I haven't seen you for two weeks. What do you think I want? I want to know no, why I... For... Look, we can't talk here. Why not? I got something to do. Then where can we talk and when? Well, how about my place in, say, an hour, huh? All right, Hody. Your place in an hour. And this is one date with me you'd better keep. You must be mistaken, Mrs. North. The necklace must be in the apartment somewhere. I know it isn't, Mr. Ryan. And you're the only other person who was in the apartment today. But I let myself in the back door and I was in the kitchen all the time. I... What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? Skip. Skip? My boy... He was helping me, and I left him there for a few minutes while I came down. Skip! Yeah? Come out here! What do you want now? Come here! Okay, okay, what's... You rotten little... Hey, what's the idea? Mr. Ryan! Take it easy, Mr. Ryan. You... Let go of me! Where's the necklace? I ain't got it! Let go of me! Let go! Stay where you are, Pa! What? Stay where you are, or you'll get hurt! A gun? Yeah, a gun. And it's loaded. Now, get away from that door, Pa. Skip. Move! Look, you little fool. You shut up, mister. Be careful, Jerry. Listen to her, Mr. North. Skip! So long, Pa. Skip! Oh, Skip. This is Skip. Oh, hi, kid. How's everything? Hody, I'm in a jam. Oh? The necklace. The people I stole it from came to Pa. What'd you do? Well, I, I kind of lost my head. Pa started slapping me around, and I, I had to pull a gun to get away. You're picking a rod? Yeah. Look, Hody, i got to have some dough. Do you know somebody who'll give you something on that necklace fast? Well, uh, yeah. Where are you calling from, Skip? A drugstore. Okay, give me a couple of hours. It's 6.30 now. Then make it 9. Where? Your place? No, no, not up. Paul, no, you might come to see me. Yeah, you're right. Well, look, you know that beer joint over on First Avenue called the Garden Spot? Yeah. You remember you used to hang out there a lot when you lived with Paul and me? Yeah, yeah, I remember. At nine. On the nose. Please, Mr. North, I know it's a lot to ask. Well, it certainly is. Your boy steals a $4,000 necklace, pulls a gun on us, He's and you are... a good boy, Mr. North. Ha! Jerry. He is, Mr. North. Or he was until last winter when he started hanging around with a bunch of young toughs in a saloon called the Garden Spot. And then Hody started coming around. Hody? My older boy. He's bad. Mm. Hody's always been bad. He's just 25, and already he's been in reform school twice and, and prison once. He's the one who's given Skip these ideas who's... 
trying to make a thief out of his brother. And it looks like he succeeded. No, Mr. North, he hasn't. Skip will be all right. I, I know he will. If you let me find him, talk to him. Let me tell him that you won't go to the police if he'll return the necklace and, and promise never to do anything like this again. Oh, let's do it, darling. Please, Mr. North. Well, all right. Thank you, Mr. North. We'll give you until tomorrow morning. And if you haven't found him by then, or if you have found him and he won't do as you ask, I'm going to the police. Understand? Oh, yes, sir, yes. All right. Come on, Pam. Mm. Oh, I have to have my head examined. I don't think so. I hope you're right. Well, we'd better get upstairs and call the Wilsons and explain that we'll be late. We're not going to the Wilsons, Pam. Oh, why not? Because we're going to follow Mr. Ryan. If he finds that kid of his, I have a hunch he's going to need someone who can yell for help. Relax, Jackie, relax, will you? It's not like that at all. Then how is it, Hody? You keep standing me up, you don't telephone... I've been busy. What's her name? It's not anything like that. Oh, Jackie, you know how I feel about you. Maybe you'd better remind me. Come to Papa. No. Baby. No, that's too easy. Sure. Nice and easy. Hold it. <laughs> Come here, you. Oh, Hody. Hody, why do you treat me like this? I'm sorry, baby. You love me, Hody. You do, don't you? I'm mad about the girl. Oh, you're... Oh, never mind. Now, nah, that's better. Hey, let's do something tonight, huh? What'll it be? The colony, stork, 21? Hody. <laughs> okay. Smiley's beer stube. It'll be him. Now Hody. You... Yeah? I'll settle for the city hall in the morning. Now, Jackie. Why do you keep stalling, Hody? You said three months ago we were going to be married. It takes dough, Jackie. A lot of dough. And that's why I haven't been seeing you lately. Honest, Tony, I've been working like a dog, trying to get a little ahead so we can do it up brown when we take the plunge. I'd like to believe that, Hody. It's the truth. Oh, baby, I don't like this waiting around any more than you do, but be a little patient, huh? All right, Hody. That's better. Now, you go home and get yourself dolled up, and I'll meet you at Smiley's. Usual time? Usual time. All right. And wear that pink dress of yours. The one that's cut... You know. All right. Yeah? Jigger Stoats, how do you telephone me? Yeah, Jigger. I got a necklace I'd like you to take a look at. Okay, bring it around in the morning. I got to see you tonight, Jigger, right now. I'll be over in about ten minutes. Why the five o'clock rush? I'm leaving town tonight. Well, look, friend, if your merchandise is that hot, I don't... It's not that... Look, Jigger, the necklace is worth 3000 easy. Four, maybe. And I'll give it to you for one. I don't like guys who want to hurry to do me favors, Hody. Where'd you get the merchandise? My kid brother lifted it. And this is cool ice, Jigger. Believe me. Then why the rush down loud? It's... It's a dame. Uh-huh. She's breathing down my neck about City Hall. Uh-huh. I'll be easy to do business with, Jigger. Can I come over? <laughs> okay, Hody. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Please, you, you don't understand. Stanley Hotel. 316. Okay. Please. Holy Ryan is my son. I don't care if he's your grandfather, Pop. He's checked out. He's gone. I don't know where he went. Now beat it, huh? Leave me alone. Just to find Hody for. From what he said, you two weren't planning to go to a father and son banquet together. I don't care about Hody. I'm looking for Skip, and I'm sure he's with Hody. Now, now please, Miss Williams, if you know where Hody is. If I knew, I'd tell you, but I don't. Now go away. Will you leave me alone? Now, now, look, mister. If the kid's only 17, he ain't never been in here. I don't serve to minors. But he hangs around here all the time. You're mistaken. No kid 17 is allowed in here. Now move along and leave me alone. Uh, 
Oh, brother, what a sightseeing tour this has turned out to be. We trailed Ryan to one hotel, one pool hall, one apartment house, five public phone booths, and now to this place. What's it called? The garden spot. Hmm. Looks as though it should be called a garbage dump. Yeah, well, since it was your idea to follow Mr. Ryan, you haven't much room for complaint, Jerry. Well, maybe not, dear, but who was it that, that wanted to call the police when the kid... Oh, brother, here we go again. Oh, no. There's Ryan getting in his taxi. The yellow cab company's certainly going to be in the black when Ryan settles up with that meter. Well, that's... Oh, Jerry, wait. Hmm? Darling, look. Where? Going into that beer parlor. Skip Ryan. And if Father doesn't see him, oh, Jerry, what do we do? I don't know what you're going to do, darling, but I'm going to call a friend of ours who happens by a comforting coincidence to be a police officer. Bill? Bill. But here he is. I'm telling you, kid, and for the last time, get out of here. I don't want no customers with fathers who come snooping around. But it's after nine. Are you sure Hody ain't been around? If he'd been around, I'd seen him now, will you? Okay, okay. The door's that way. I'm going to wait out back. Ah, oh, Hody, Hody, where the devil are you? Skipper. Don't you? Skipper. Hody. Hody, where are you? Over here. Where? I can't see nothing. This alley's as black as... Here. You. Just past the door. Over here. Where? Hody, I can't see. Hody. Hody, what's the matter? Uh, take a look at my back, kid. I got a knife in it. You suppose the Ryan boy's still in there, Jerry? You didn't see him come out, did you? No. Well, then. Oh, where the devil is Bill? He should be here by now. I still say you shouldn't have telephoned him. After all, you did promise Mr. Ryan. I called Bill Wigand as, as a... a friend, not as a policeman, I know. But that's drawing a rather fine distinction if you're asking oh, me. Oh, here he is. Bill? Yeah, that's his car pulling up across the street. Come on, let's go. Okay. Here we are, Bill. Hello, Pam. Hi, Bill. Hi, Jerry. Well, what's this all about? Well, it's like this, Bill. A boy named Skip Ryan, the son of the janitor in our apartment building, stole a necklace of Pam's. He's, he's sitting there at the bar now. Where? Well, right. Hey, what the... Jerry, he's gone. But he was right there just a second ago. Come on. Now, look, will you two oh, tell hurry, me what Bill. the... Uh... Bartender? Yeah? Uh, the, the boy, the one that was sitting here, where is he? What boy? He was sitting right here a minute ago. Oh, you know who we mean. Now, come on. Look, who are you people to come busting in uh, here? This is who I am, fella. Oh, sorry, Lieutenant. Well, when I wouldn't serve him, he left out the back way, the door to the alley. Well, that's better. Come on, Pam and Jerry. What happened, Hootie? Who did it? Jackie. Jackie? Huh? Oh, I... I should have closed the transom before I talked to Jigger. Huh? Uh, Jackie. Jackie heard me tell Jigger I... I wanted to run out on her. <laughs> and she followed me and... Someone's coming out of the beer joint. I'll tell him... But hold up. Golly, it's Like the inside of a park. And the kid's probably six blocks away by this time. Hold Shut up. up. Come on, come on. Let's go back inside. And you two tell me what this is all about. <sighs> They're gone. Hody, you're hurt. You should have let me tell him. I got other plans. But, listen. What? The necklace. I got a grand for it. A thousand? But you told me you couldn't get more than two. Oh, I got more. But listen. Now, listen to me. I don't have it now. Jackie took it. Now, let us you and me go back and get it, huh? But you can't walk in. It's only a couple of blocks. I know it, but you... So if I can't walk, I'll crawl. I'll... I'll keep this date with Jackie if I have to get there on my hands and knees. Uh, we're, we're doing okay, huh, Skip? Yeah. Sure. We're doing fine. Another block. Cody. What? Up ahead. At the corner. The cop on the beat. Back against the building. Cody, you can... Get me back against the building. Come on. Oh. Okay. Now... If he doesn't leave in a minute, if we go around the block. You'll never make it. Huh? Think so. 
Watch me, kid. Just watch me. Almost there, kid. Let me put my arm around your shoulder, huh? Sure. Oh. Oh. Hey, boy. Oh. Hey, look. Hey, what's the matter, kid? Your pal take on too much ballast? Yeah, yeah. Want some help? No, no, he's okay. Do it yourself, kid. Come on, my darling. Oh. Good boy, Skip. Well, Jackie, here we come. Made it, Skip. Made it. Huh. Ring the bell. Now that gun you got, Jimmy. What? Jimmy. What do you want it for? To collect a thousand bucks. Shh. Oh, okay, Odie. Hello, Jackie. Odie. What's the matter, Jackie? We had a date, didn't we? Odie! <laughs> It's ridiculous to go cruising around this neighborhood anymore. Jerry's right, Pam. Now, look, why don't we... Skip Ryan went into that bar for some reason, not just to have a drink. But the fact remains that we've lost Skip Ryan and Mr. Ryan. So so why don't Uh, we... Jerry, stop the car. Pam, what the... Stop. Okay, okay. Now, will you tell us what... That apartment house. Well, what about it? It's the one Mr. Ryan went into while we were following him. And you said he apparently called on someone in apartment 905. To which I must reply, so what? So maybe Mr. Ryan got some information from apartment 905. It would be useful to us, dear. Are you proposing that we go in there and... Yes. Oh, Bill, for Pete's sake. She's your wife, Jerry. Coward. Coward. 